Good morning, everyone. The oversight hearing by the Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans, and Wildlife will now come to order. Today, day 57 of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the Subcommittee continues its inquiry into the largest environmental disaster in the United States history. Last week, we heard from distinguished panelists about the short and the long-term impacts of the oil spill on trust resources, including fisheries, birds, and other wildlife, marine mammals, tribal resources, protected fish and wildlife habitats, beaches, our coasts, and other natural areas. It was abundantly clear from that hearing that the communities that depend on these resources, from fishermen and hunters to the tourism industry, will be reeling from the impacts of this oil spill for decades. Today's hearing will investigate both what we know and what we do not know about the environment to guide the oil spill response and recovery activities in the Gulf of Mexico. Clearly, there is so much that we do not know because of the unprecedented scale and complexity of this oil spill. But some of these unknowns can be eliminated through transparent access to data and information and adequate deployment of assets to measure and monitor the spill. We need to know how much oil has spilled and continues to spill into the Gulf. We need to know the fate of this oil in desperation at the surface and in the water column. We need to collect and integrate baseline environmental data to properly assess natural resource damages. This information is critical to our response and recovery activities because what gets measured gets managed. Sadly, there is so much that will not be managed because of the gaps and the limits in our understanding of the complex estuarine, coastal, and marine environments in the Gulf. We have made such limited investments in coastal science programs and ocean observation systems that it has proven difficult to provide timely and accurate scientific information to target response activities and to assess damages to natural resources. Whether we know enough to mitigate the impacts of this oil spill, to properly compensate the public for damages to natural resources, and to prevent catastrophic oil spills in the future, remains to be seen, but we must strive to make the public whole and to take every precaution to never let a disaster like this happen again. I want to thank this morning all the witnesses for being here during this very challenging and busy time, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Cassidy, the acting ranking Republican member of this subcommittee for any statement that he may, he may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your scheduling this hearing on the resources and knowledge available to the federal government, especially NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service in responding to the Deepwater Horizon spill. It's been 57 days since the Deepwater Horizon exploded and sank some 42 miles off the coast of Louisiana. It's an ongoing disaster for the Gulf Coast region, its economy and environment, and the millions who live there. And it's a tragedy cut in stone for those who have lost loved ones. Um, particularly, it's an ongoing tragedy for those whose jobs are dependent upon the Gulf of Mexico. And a new tragedy is the President's moratorium on offshore drilling, which will effectively destroy the livelihoods of tens of thousands of Louisianians who rely upon well-paying energy jobs to support their families. At previous hearings, I've referred to the National Academy of Science report, Oil in the Sea 3. This report was released in 2003 and had many recommendations to federal agencies regarding natural and man-made releases of oil and the research necessary to understand their effects. However, there are many recommendations in this report and other reports, such as the 2004 Spill of National Significance report, which have not been acted upon by these agencies. At last week's subcommittee hearing, concerns were raised about the use of disbursements. Well, there seems to be some understanding of the impact of dispersants use on the water surface, but their concerns about the short and long-term impact of their use within the water column. We also do not, do not have much information on how oil degrades and 
the ultra deep and deep waters as well as in sensitive marine areas some of our witnesses today will discuss this and tell us where the science is limited it's apparent that we do not have the knowledge necessary to address a spill this size it's a disappointment that the environmental protection agency which was invited and has issued permits allowing the use of subsurface dispersants apparently felt that this hearing was not worth their time at today's hearing we'll examine what information was available to the federal government prior to this bill that each agency have adequate baseline data available for the gulf of mexico region to understand the impacts of the oil in an area where oil and gas exploration occurs daily it would seem essential to have this information but a lot of federal efforts following the spill particularly the responses of NOAA and epa have been to create baseline data from scratch rather than acting upon an existing set of knowledge and preparations and why haven't we learned from the previous skills i've asked in this committee on numerous occasions about the nineteen seventy nine x cock drilling accident in the gulf of mexico how it informed us uh, why could we not do what the norwegians did when they have actually studied the effects of oil in the deep water uh, lake barre was an oil spill in the louisiana marshes none of my witnesses so far have been able to tell us how cleanups in that area could inform our cleanups in this area I look forward to these panels and I'm confident that you'll be able to. Why are outside researchers and even private citizens able to tell the federal government things long before the federal government is able to come to the same conclusion? For instance, why were researchers able to tell from watching BP's spill cam over the internet that more, more oil was being discharged than was being estimated and then the federal government had to create a new committee before it could tell us that these researchers were right? And why haven't we test? Why have we not tested dispersant use in deep water? What information is available in sensitive coastal areas? Did the administration react quickly enough to protect these areas? Do we know how long these coastal wetlands will? Uh, do we know how they'll respond and how long it will take them to recover? How can we be more innovative in our approach in dealing with disasters like this, including reducing the federal red tape that seems to hamstring our efforts at creating new approaches? There are a great many outstanding scientists working at our universities, and especially in my state and other states uh, affected by the spill, who should be consulted to understand these issues and find solutions. Instead, I've heard from academic professionals in Louisiana and elsewhere that they are not being offered the opportunity to engage the federal government and share their wide-ranging expertise, and that even after this spill, they've had little opportunity to provide input. And I've also been told by some researchers that they are being intimidated by BP to not go into the marshes to publish their scientific uh, findings, and if they do, they will risk legal action. The federal government should be actively seeking the input of the academic community and ensuring that the data collected is published so we can learn from this devastating event. Madam Chair, I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses who will give us their unique perspective on the impacts of this oil spill disaster. I thank the gentleman from Louisiana for his opening statement, and I would now like to recognize our first panel of witnesses to testify. Uh, before we do that, I would like to ask those that are standing in the back, you can take the chairs up here in the lower dais if you'd like to be seated. This may be a lengthy hearing, and uh, I don't know that you can be able to stand through it all. Please feel... Uh, Welcome to sit, sit there. Our witnesses this morning on panel one include Mr. David Kennedy, the Acting Assistant Administrator, National Ocean Service, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Dr. Marcia McNutt, Director, U.S. Geological Survey. Dr. Jonathan A. Cuttington, Associate Director for Research and Collections, National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution. And Dr. Merv Athingas, Committee on Oil in the Sea, National Research Council. I would like to thank all of you for being here today. And as we begin, I would note that the red timing light on the table will indicate when your five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. We would very much appreciate your cooperation in complying with these limits. But be assured, ladies and gentlemen, that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. And 
now, Mr. Kennedy, welcome back to our subcommittee, and thank you for being here today. Please begin your testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bordaio and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify on the critical role of ocean observations and data in this time of crisis uh, and areas for future emphasis. Uh, my name is David Kennedy, Acting Assistant Administrator, uh, Ocean Service Coastal Zone Management for NOAA. I've uh, been deeply involved in this bill and many before. Uh, but before I move on, uh, I, I want uh, to discuss uh, NOAA's efforts. I, I'd like first to express my condolences to the families of the 11 people who lost their lives in the explosion and sinking of the Deepwater Horizon platform. The entire agency is deeply concerned about the immediate and long-term environmental, economic, and social impacts to the Gulf Coast and the nation as a whole from this bill. NOAA is fully mobilized and working tirelessly to lessen impacts on the Gulf Coast and will continue to do so until the spill is controlled, oil is cleaned up, natural resource injuries are assessed, and restoration is complete. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, my comments on the importance of ocean observations in the Gulf of Mexico and future areas for enhancing oil spill response. Unfortunately, this oil spill is a grave reminder that spills of national significance can occur can occur despite the safeguards and improvements that have been put uh, into place since the passage of the Oil, Oil Pollution Act of 1990. If a spill does occur, responders must be equipped with the appropriate tools and information. An effective response based on solid science and smart decision-making resources, environmental and socioeconomic impacts, as well as cleanup costs. I'm going to talk just briefly about surface observations, and then I'll go to subsurface. One of NOAA's roles during the oil spill is to provide uh, scientific information to the federal on-scene coordinator. One of the products NOAA provi uh, pri provides are spill trajectories, real-time data on currents, tides and winds, as well as sustained observations and physical and chemical parameters of the whole water column are important in driving the models that inform our understanding of the likely path of the spilled oil. The usefulness of NOAA's trajectory model depends on, in part on the accuracy of the input data. Observational data play a critical role in ensuring the most accurate trajectory forecast is provided. These forecasts ensure that local communities have advanced warning of potential impacts, and as a result, that plans can be put in place to protect sensitive natural resources. For modeling the surface movement of oil, ocean observations such as high-frequency radar play a critical role. High-frequency radars deliver near real-time surface current data 24-7, covering thousands of square miles simultaneously. Surface currents of the ocean are key inputs to the models that generate estimates of the extent and trajectory of an oil spill. In the Gulf of Mexico, this information is provided from the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Ocean Observing System, GCUS, and the Southeast Coastal Ocean Observing Regional Association, SECORA. Uh, these regional associations are part of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, uh, a federal, regional, and private sector partnership working to enhance our ability to collect deliver and use ocean information. Because we cannot predict where a spill will occur, data delivery from high-frequency radars is envisioned to be part of a seamless national system that will ensure information 24-7. As IUS generates more data from technological advances like high-frequency radar, the prediction of oil's location will be improved by pulling these observations into NOAA's trajectory models. Subsurface observations. As the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is demonstrating, our nation's existing capacity to deliver an accurate depiction of subsurface movement is limited. Uh, although there is some capacity across the federal and non-federal oceanography community, ocean currents, oil density and behavior, and oil droplet size are all significant contributors to whether oil rises to the ocean surface or remain below the surface. The subsurface concentration of dis dissolved oil or oil droplets is of significant concern in understanding how fisheries, marine mammals, and other species in the water column will be affected. The broad oceanographic community has responded in remarkable fashion and made available the best of their expertise and technology to better inform our understanding of the subsurface movement of oil. However, to detect the presence of subsurface oil and estimate its, its movements beneath the surface, one needs a suite of observing assets combined with three-dimensional ocean circulation models. While ship surveys have been uh, the conventional method for observing three-dimensional fields of temperature, salinity, and other proper properties such as chlorophyll and nutrients, this method is slow and costly. A combination of profiling floats, moored buoys with profiling sensors and gliders have the capability to deliver the information of the temporal and spatial parameters needed. 
In addition to enhancing observations in the Gulf of Mexico to produce more robust trajectory models of surface and subsurface oil, additional research, enhanced response capability, and improved tools and technical, uh, technological in innovation by the public or private sector would greatly improve our ability to respond to the level expected uh, by the nation. To mitigate environmental effects of future spills, responders must be equipped with sufficient capacity and capabilities to address the challenge. If another large spill were to occur simultaneously in another location elsewhere in the United States, NOAA would have difficulty responding to its, uh, to its complete ability. Strong science is critical to effective decision making to minimize the ecological and ec economic impacts from and mitigate the effects of oil spills on coastal and marine resources and associated communities. Existing research has resulted in the advance of some response technologies. More can be done, however, to strengthen our nation's response capability and continued development of tools and strategies can only increase the effectiveness of oil spills. In closing, I assure you that NOAA will not relent in our efforts to protect the livelihoods of affected Gulf Coast residents and mitigate the environmental impacts of this spill. Thank you for allowing me the time. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for your insight on NOAA's response capacity and capabilities. Dr. McNutt, please proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Woman Badayo and members of the subcommittee. I'm Marcia McNutt, Director of the U.S. Geological Survey and Science Advisor to the Secretary of the Interior. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Underwood, who's sitting directly behind me, Acting Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey. Before I begin, I'd also like to extend my sympathies to the families of those who lost their lives in the explosion and the sinking of the Deepwater Horizon, to those who were injured, and to those whose way of life has been changed for years to come, as my life has also changed since this tragedy began to unfold as I've been consumed 17 hours a day, seven days a week, and my work schedule focused on this tragedy. I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the importance of data and analysis about the complex estuarine, coastal, and marine environments of the Gulf. Accurate scientific information is essential for effectively targeting response activities and for assessing damage to the natural resources in the aftermath of this oil spill. The greatest challenge in characterizing the fate and transport of contamination resulting from the flow of oil and gas from the Deepwater Horizon site lies in a combination of factors. The volume of the oil, the expanse of air, sea, and land into which it flows, and the biodiversity of the ecosystems that it is impacting. The first step is to document the amount of oil and create an improved mass balance of the various natural and anthropogenic sinks in the deep sea and at the ocean surface as a function of time since the spill began. Next, we must understand the physical processes that control the movement of contaminants from the open ocean into the coastal zone. Oil and oil dispersant mixtures will be a source of contamination to coastlines and the seafloor for a long time and will be transported long distances by surface and subsurface currents. A complete understanding of the pre-existing condition of the water, sediment, and biota is vital to any scientific investigation of the effects of an oil spill on the environment. The USGS Science Centers in the Gulf region have coordinated efforts to sample material from coastal wetlands, DOI lands on shore, and the barrier islands most likely to be impacted. The long-term impact of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on the Northern Gulf and other coastal systems will depend on how the oil and oil degradation products are incorporated and cycled among the various components of the coastal system. A wide range of data and analyses will be needed over the coming months and years, including chemical signatures of oil and dispersant, estimates of volume of oil released, visual and meteorological records of surface conditions and the surface slick, Landfall data, including dates, locations, estimated volumes, and characteristics of the oil and tar. The Department's Natural Resource Damage Assessment and Restoration Program allows DOI agencies with trust responsibilities to document injury to natural resources as a result of oil spills or hazardous substances releases, assess damages, and restore those injured resources. Currently, USGS scientists are providing scientific support to DOI and NOAA 
programs on more than a dozen technical work groups investigating topics that range from aerial imagery to deep water corals to data management to terrestrial and aquatic species. While cor current USGS efforts are focused on response to the oil spill, USGS managers and scientists are also planning for future research needs associated with the spill. The team, which includes personnel from Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, and MMS, is developing a long-term science plan designed to address the research needs as we move from an immediate response to a more mature response phase of this event and into recovery. Lessons learned from Exxon Valdez oil spill suggests that a long-term, on the order of decades, multi-level ecosystem perspective will be essential. Therefore, we recommend that studies include investigations at the landscape level, as well as those that are localized and include process-based research. Impacts of the oil spill to communities and ecosystems will be far-reaching and long-term throughout the Gulf of Mexico, where many coastal communities depend on ecosystem services for their livelihood, quality of life, and protection from natural hazards. Information on these impacts on economic activities demographics, ecosystem services, as well as options for adaptation, resilience planning are needed to help communities try to regain pre-spill productivity and social well-being. In conclusion, the impacts of disasters such as this must be considered in the time frame not of weeks and months, but of years to decades. Oil can remain toxic in the environment over the long term and its chronic harmful effects will impact the interconnected systems and communities of living things, including people throughout the Gulf region. The USGS will continue to work closely with other Department of the Interior and other federal and state agencies, as well as the private sector in response to this spill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm pleased to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. McNutt, for describing what we know and what we do not know about the oil spill. Dr. Cuttington, please begin your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Bardayo and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. I'm the Associate Director of Research and Collections at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution, and I too would like to extend my sympathies to those who lost their lives and those who lost their livelihood due to this disaster. Our collections at the Smithsonian are among the largest in the world. We have approximately 126 million specimens that's about 94% of everything that the Smithsonian has. About one-third of those collections are marine. Scientific collections are a vital part of the national scientific infrastructure. Time and again, they prove their worth by answering important questions and solving important problems. To give you one recent example, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 collided with birds and crash-landed in the Hudson River. It was our DNA and our specimen that identified the birds as Canada geese. It's important to know which birds cause accidents. We're also often involved with the early detection of invasive species when they invade the United States. And we also support threat assessments to our armed forces by developing profiles of disease vectors specific to regions where they are fighting or stationed, for example, in both Iraq and, and Afghanistan today. As another final example, Climate change is predicted to be especially detectable at the North and the South Pole. For the last many years, we've been collaborating with the U.S. Antarctic Program to develop the largest and best collections of the biota of the Antarctic available to date. We are ready to provide baseline data for scientific studies to measure climate change, just as we can provide baseline data today on the Gulf of Mexico's pre-spill environment. As others have pointed out, this is the worst ecological disaster, man-made ecological disaster in the U.S. history. Its impact and extent at this moment are only estimates, not known facts. All the stakeholders in this event will benefit from facts, and therefore solid information on the pre-spill environment is important. For the last 30 years, we have collaborated with the MMS, which is the Marine Mineral Management Service, to archive the collections from their environmental studies program. Most of these collections focus on the Gulf because that was where most drilling occurred. I would like to emphasize how unusual it is and how lucky we are to have these quantitative collections. Because of the cost of ship time and the difficulty of the work, marine surveys are extremely expensive, especially at great depth. In total, these collections amount to more than 330,000 samples 
of these, more than 93,000 are from the Gulf of Mexico. They were collected at over 500 depths at over 1,000 different locations. However, about a third of the relevant collections have not been cataloged and have made, and been made publicly available to science. The map on display you can see here gives you some idea of the geographic coverage. The red dots are the collections from the MMS quantitative samples. Each one of those red dots is a place that may have yielded hundreds of, spe hundreds of species and thousands of specimens. The yellow dots represent the regular Smithsonian marine collections. I brought two examples with me today just to show you what these things are like. This large specimen here is a giant isopod collected at about 500 meters in depth. They get almost three feet long. They are creatures of the deep. I also have, I hope, circulating among you in a, in a plastic box uh, specimens of coral. Those corals are keystone species because they create the environment on which other organisms depend. These make deep water reefs, which can be hundreds of meters high, hundreds of meters wide, and even miles long. Most of the specimens we have, of course, are not this spectacular, but these are the most extensive collections of marine organisms from U.S. continental shells. In summary, these Smithsonian collections are now a unique and irreplaceable resource to characterize the Gulf pre-spill environment. However, until we know exactly what questions are going to be asked, I can't say exactly how these collections will help us to answer these questions, but they are likely to be critical in many contexts. Research and assessment of impacts will go on for decades, and most of that will need pre-spill data. However, I would also say that getting more pre-spill data is important. We don't have much time left to gather data of that sort. We should also make sure that we are gathering and archiving baseline data and information from whenever oil and gas exploration is going on in the outer continental shelf. All stakeholders benefit from the fact. This is relatively cheap and easy to do. And I'd also like to emphasize that about a third of the MMS collections and other Smithsonian collections, which would be scientifically valuable for pre-spill environments, are not yet fully worked up, cataloged, and publicly available for science. Finishing that now is a high priority for us. Finally, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Cuddington, for informing us about the valuable collection and resources at the Smithsonian that can help address recovery activities. And next, we will hear from Dr. Fingus. Good morning, Chairman Bordello and subcommittee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. First, I would like to reintroduce the National Academy of Sciences who have conducted some recent studies that are quite relevant to the Gulf oil spill. The Academy has regularly conducted studies of several facets of oil spills in the past 30 years. These are typically carried out by independent, unbiased scientists who are involved in the field and have specific expertise to bear on the topic at hand. I'll highlight two such studies. The first study is the oil in the study three, which is already highlighted by Mr. Cassidy. It's uh, this study here. This study focused on two facets of oil spills. First, estimating the amount of oil discharged into the sea from various sources. And secondly, to assess the fate and effects of that oil uh, in the environment. A number of recommendations were made in that report, probably the most important being that the importance of obtaining real data sets from real spills such as the current Gulf spill. The second study is a study of oil spill dispersants, which was uh, published in 205-206. Oil spill dispersants are surfactant mixtures along with solvents which are intended to enhance the production of small droplets in the water column. There are many issues with oil spill dispersants which are uh, covered in this book, including the fact that dispersants ultimately break down and oil rises to the surface again, the toxicity of such dispersions, and the effectiveness of products. Again, a number of recommendations are made on the, the study and use of dispersants in this report. Again, I should emphasize the importance of one recommendation being that of obtaining real data sets such as in the current spill. 
Finally, I have made a number of comments on initiating research programs. I have been involved in my whole life in developing and carrying out research programs and felt it necessary to share some of these lessons. I am pleased to be here and will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fingis, for your expertise and your recommendations. And we do have questions for all of the panelists. And I'll begin with myself. Um, David Kennedy from NOAA. Uh, this incident has exposed the liabilities of not having in place an integrated ocean observation capability in the Gulf, which has been pared back substantially over the past two years due to the cuts in the NOAA budget. Fortunately, NOAA has recently found funds to redeploy some of the assets, such as high-frequency radar and gliders, to bolster ocean observations and improve our ability to forecast and project the movement of the spill. Can you please, Mr. Kennedy, update the subcommittee on what NOAA has done to restore ocean observation assets in the Gulf? As I stated in my testimony, uh, those observations are essential uh, to us being able to provide some of the products and services. Um, the Everything we would like to do in observations in this country, uh, we haven't been able to do, obviously. Um, funding is limited, and, uh, and you always have to make decisions. Um, we have, uh, as a result of this spill, been able to bring many, many other assets that we didn't have funded haven't been able to acquire the funding for um, to the scene uh, and, and uh, actually execute everything from, as you suggest, uh, gliders uh, to some uh, additional HF radar uh, ships um, that are all on the water that uh, wouldn't otherwise have been uh, AUVs. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, that is a, uh, a partnership with the community in the Gulf, including uh, Department of Defense, to bring those other assets to bear uh, in this uh, in this crisis, uh, the funding for all of those types of things uh, either is uh, funding that's been diverted from other places or funding directly in support of the incident command, the unified command. So that's the Coast Guard and so on. Uh, so we we have uh, provided a, 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 a whole suite of new observational tools but they come from communities that where that was not standard uh, practice and things that we were able to fund. So we have the tools there, but it's because of the crisis, and uh, we could always use more. Mr. Kennedy, how long does NOAA intend to maintain these assets? Well, certainly for the extent uh, of, of the, uh, the crisis now. And so a as we look uh, uh, at there being oil uh, into whenever the oil, the, uh, the well, the uh, additional wells are, are drilled and, and the well uh, release is stopped, we, we will keep those assets in place mm -hmm. and then probably be on because it will be oil in the water and need to continue to track it for some time after the well is stopped. Mm -hmm. So certainly into the fall, but we don't have the long-term funding stream to keep all those assets in place. So until the fall, is that uh, right? Uh, certainly okay. until the fall. Um, it, it depends um, on, on how many times we have interruptions in the drilling process over the course of the summer, but uh, we're, we're thinking September, October at a minimum. So for the subcommittee records, do you agree that the federal government and BP's understanding of the spill and response to it could have been far more efficient and cost effective had a regional integrated ocean observation system been up and running? Well, we had a system up and running, uh, it, but what I'm suggesting is that we have additional assets that we've had to bring on beyond what the uh, integrated ocean observing system had available to us. So. So the, the system that you had up and running wasn't adequate? It, it, was, not, it, it was not comprehensive. Uh, we have a budget that, that, uh, it, that is a national budget, and uh, we have to very carefully look at how those assets are deployed nationally. Mm -hmm. So we could always do more than we've done, and you, you've heard about all the things we have put in place. All right, I have a couple of other questions for you. Um, as you know, NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration has been severely underfunded for the past several years, and as a result had to initiate a stringent workforce restructuring plan to downsize operations. 
do you feel that this downsizing impaired no is ability to respond to the deepwater horizon spill and what additional skill sets does no one need to restore the capabilities over the last several years yes we have seen decreases in that budget and as a result of had to right size if you will that organization and as a result we lost contractors and federal employees to get to that location or at least transferred federal employees to other places our feeling for some time has been that that capacity if it were stretched by a very significant spill or two events at once could certainly compromise our ability to to respond nationally and this crisis has certainly shown that those limited resources have made it difficult for us to to do everything we would like to do that having been said we have managed within NOAA to bring back retirees some some retired as long as 10 years and and tap other sources within NOAA taking them away from their their primary missions to supplement the activities that the office response and restoration is responsible for it on scene and operationally so I believe we've been able to be creative but if if we hadn't done that our capacity is somewhat limited and we couldn't do more when did you bring back these former employees was that just for this bill or did were they on no just for this bill as as our responsibilities increased and as you've heard command post an area command that an incident command and one in Mobile and then one in so on and so forth across the country every place there's Coast Guard no one needs to be there to provide the operational scientific support and so as as our responsibilities and the complexity of the issues increased we started looking for other people to bring in and we probably have as many as 10 12 retirees back but as a result of working for us directly on this bill now has this underfunding limited NOAA's ability to aggressively pursue the creation of a new oil spill of a new trajectory models we we have been working on a three-dimensional model it's been one of the things that we felt as we've looked at the deeper and deeper exploration needed to be in place and and we have invested where we could obviously if we had more resources we could have moved that along quicker we have been doing the best we can with the resources we have though to to look at new models that we think are absolutely essential as we get into these kinds of complex issues thank you very much mr. Kennedy I know Rick recognize the ranking member mr. Cassidy mr. Kennedy we've had all these people speak and and I've had the opportunity of going to my university my hometown LSU has done a lot of this work I see dr. Portier has a microbe that they used I think in the Lake Barre spill that have been chewing up bacteria in that spill and they felt like it was proven efficacy so far it's not been considered for this marshland spill it makes me think that all our responses are ad hoc it's not like okay if there's a spill in a marshland area this is how we do it rather it's kind of like oh my gosh let's bring the ship back from Africa let's try and hire a couple boats that don't belong to us let's marshal resources and let's figure out how we do this going along now is that a fair or unfair perception I have I think every spill is unique no question about it and uh, <coughs> as a result you have to be adaptive every spill is different you have to be adaptive but there none, nonetheless uh, physics and biology are uh, principles which apply in all situations if there is a marshland spill in Lake Barre Lake Terrebonne uh, and we know that there's a certain marshland there which granted there is issues peculiar to that it seems like there's lessons that could be applied the rest of my answer was that having been said uh, <coughs> there is a, a, a significant amount of research that's been done for marsh cleanup for instance um, <coughs> we have an international oil spill conference every two years been doing that for 30 40 years something like that uh, we went back uh, just recently uh, as a result in part of, of uh, listening to some of your questions in previous uh, hearings a and and I think dug up 70 some particular specific uh, um, presentations at the last several oil spill conferences that looked at marsh cleanup 
and, and either research or direct uh, experience from cleanups and, and how they, um, and how they, they came out and uh, lessons learned kinds of things. So uh, we have many experts on the ground working directly in this spill that have either been involved in that research, been involved in 100 spills in their career, that have a lot of expertise on March so let me ask you again, just because I, ha I haven't spoken to him directly, but I yeah. saw a press report. Dr. Portier, who, again, was involved, I think, in Exxon Valdez, but also, I gather, in the coast of Louisiana, mm -hmm. he's got this bacteria that he says chews it up. We, we lay it out now, it's gone by, or at least mitigated by Christmas. And sure. yet, somehow, he feels like he can't get a hearing on that. So um, there's been a lot of work done on that, on that bacteria. On, on, on I'm not s specifically referring to the one you're uh, yes. addressing, but in general. Uh, and so we have a lot of experience with that, with that uh, kind of approach. I was at the Exxon Valdez involved in the science there. I, I worked to, to look at some of those t types of, uh, of uh, uh, applications. And uh, uh, what we've been saying pretty clearly to those, and I get calls daily, uh, uh, many of them being from, from folks that have uh, some sort of a, a microbe eating or oil eating microbe, uh, that our experience is that if you have a controlled environment like a lake, uh, that uh, the application of those microbes may do some good. But when you have an open ocean environment, the one thing that we have research on is very clear is that the microbial activity, quadruple, oh, uh, much more than that, that the microbial activity, that those microbes that are eating the oil, uh, just exponentially uh, uh, expand. And you have a natural environment where those microbes are actually very, very aggressively at work. And to, to apply another type of thing to uh, what Mother Nature is doing a great job of in an uncontrolled environment where you don't know where it's going to be the next Now, let me interrupt hard. you because it's yeah. very good. Thank you for the interchange. Mm -hmm. When you say Mother Nature is doing a great job, it's, it suggests you have a measure of optimism about how, the, how Mother Nature is currently dealing with the oil in the marshes. Uh, I do have a measure of optimism, quite frankly, uh, and, and, I, and that comes from a, a lot of years of, of my own experience uh, and the type of oil that we currently have in that marsh. That oil is highly degraded. The very, very toxic ends uh, that uh, are of the greatest concern to us in a marsh are missing b by the time it gets to shore. That having been said, is there not a, are there issues? There most certainly are issues, and, and they have to be addressed, uh, but there's a number of techniques for cleaning marsh that uh, we have been recommending that I think may be used, I, I, and quite frankly, one of those is to leave it alone, because if you get in there and start messing around with it, it you may make it worse than it's already going to be. Now, let me ask you two more things, if I may. Uh, the, um, I was told, and again, I've learned in this job to say what I've been told, not what I know, <laughs> um, that um, about a year or two ago that NOAA was approached, it was recommended by academics that you purchase an ROV begin to do research in the ultra deep and the deep uh, and uh, Noah said uh, no we don't need to do that it, you know is that true or not true or no money or what um, I, I don't have first-hand knowledge of that uh, I, I know that we have been discussing in NOAA ROVs and their application for some time we certainly have been using private uh, enterprise to do some of that uh, but um, uh, I may have somebody on the panel that can help me. I, I, I can't specifically answer. I'd be happy to get back to you. Dr. McNutt is raising her hand. Uh, she's writing me a note, and I'd, oh. I'd just prefer she speak <laughs> if, if she has the right. <laughs> Let me get you talking. N NOAA is commissioning through their ocean exploration program an ROV for their flagship, uh, the Okeanos Explorer, and that uh, ROV is coming online. Was that in reaction to this, or was that a plan? No, no, that was a plan that's long gotcha. been. Lastly, uh, just because I'm out of time, not that I don't have more questions, uh, you mentioned that there's a lack of dollars, and I look at uh, your uh, budget for your, uh, I don't have the acronym, Ocean Observation, Regional Observations Program, your fiscal year 10 enacted budget's $27 million, your fiscal year 11 present request is $14.6 million. It seems like you're saying that you don't have enough money, but you're cutting your budget, <laughs> which um, requires, I guess, a note of explanation. Well, um, uh, I, would, I would like to submit something specifically, but uh, it's my understanding that there's an anomaly in those numbers that you have, that the budget is stable. It hasn't increased, but that the budget uh, over the last two or three years has been pretty much uh, uh, stable. So there, there is an anomaly in there, and I, I can't give you the exact reason for that. I'd be happy to get back to you. Yeah, because it looks like you're down, your request is down 12 million relative to last year. 
uh, there is an anomaly in there, but uh, I've been told by the IU's people that uh, there hasn't been, they, they specifically tell me there has not been a decrease, but uh, there is an anomaly in there that I, that I can't address you. I yield back. Yeah. I thank the uh, ranking member. Uh, I have one question before I recognize the uh, next member of the committee. Last week, I was in Guam, which is my home district, and I boarded the NOAA uh, research ship out there that's, I understand it's equipped with the latest scientific, uh, would this ship uh, be of any use in something like this? Um, I was very impressed with what, what they can do. Possibly. Uh, you should know that um, we, we have a number of vessels throughout the, the nation uh, stationed in different places. And over the last uh, uh, couple of months, uh, a number of the missions of, of vessels that are more directly uh, in and around the Gulf area have been repurposed uh, and, and now are on sometimes their second and third uh, mission specifically uh, supporting the oil spill response. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we've tried to do is understand that the whole agency shouldn't grind to a halt to do this, that we have many, many other very mm -hmm. compelling responsibilities. And to the extent that we can, we haven't tried to bring the whole fleet back from the world uh, to do this. If we felt like we could either contract uh, with uh, uh, academic uh, institutions or, or use our ships more closely to the, the scene, and that's what's happened. A and so. Um, those ships that are far, far away, we're trying to let continue mm -hmm. to do their, their very, very important <laughs> missions where they well are. Well, I know, Mr. Kennedy, you have approximately 10, is it, NOAA vessels, uh, but this is supposed to have the very latest scientific uh, equipment on board, and they're over there in the Marianas uh, Trench area. So I just wondered, I mean, that's a deep area. And uh, why I'm not I'm not familiar with this specific vessel, but I think it, um, the, the technology that you may be referring to, we actually have on a vessel that's in, in the uh, theater in the Gulf right. now and, and right. doing similar work. A and I think it has to do with uh, um, some of our survey and charting side of the house. Well, thank you. I'd like now to uh, recognize uh, the gentleman from CNMI, Mr. Sablon. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your leadership on, on all these important issues facing us today, not just the, the spill, but uh, on every day with wildlife. And um, I believe that whenever oil touches water, we've lost the fight. But I've also, you know, we've lost, lives have been lost on this in this disaster. Livelihoods have been disrupted, and of course, living organisms may be um, affected for a very, very long time. Um, I also think that the response by federal government agents, by federal agencies, have been inadequate. Um, I'm very happy that our president uh, is down there for the fourth time and that he's uh, going to be addressing the nation tonight. Um, um, and I hope he could start kicking some behinds, not just with the private sector, but with federal agencies. I really believe that the response, there has actually been no response. We've been reacting to some of these things. Um, and of course, again, today, um, you know, we're saying that if we had the resources, if we had more money, we would have been able to respond. But this is something I hear every time there's a federal, there's a, a major event in the nation. If we had more money and uh, we never seem to have enough money going anywhere. Um, but again, I'm not blaming anyone at the table today. Um, some of you have done a really good job too, but Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Magnot, um, um, your testimony, um, you, you mentioned that the U.S. Geological Service presence is in all the 50 states and Puerto Rico. Uh, what about the territories? You know, there's other places called the, the American Samoa, mm -hmm. Guam, the Virgin Islands, and the Northern Maryland Islands, which has right now three active volcanoes. So it's always spewing something up there. Um, um, we had people actually on one of the islands just right next to the volcano and it erupted because uh, there's no way for them to tell that it was going to erupt. Uh, there was ground shaking and then the next thing we know they erupted and there's those places don't even have radios and uh, other federal agencies sent people up there. I mean, I'm not talking about a couple of people at this time. There were like over two dozen people up there doing survey for eventually for something we have absolutely no. Um, what happened? Uh, is it more money? Well, 
we have a volcano hazards program. And the truth is that uh, volcano hazards and volcano eruptions are uh, one of the uh, hazards that uh, is forecastable with instrumentation in place. And uh, in uh, this particular case, uh, there um, we are uh, working um, through our funding to make sure that um, volcanoes that are um, uh, viewed to be uh, in uh, imminent danger or um, forecast to uh, be in populated areas uh, are um, indeed uh, monitored. And I don't know in the case of these particular volcanoes whether they were being monitored. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that there have been a number of uh, wonderful examples of volcano warnings that were put out in a, a timely fashion. Right. Yeah. And for the record, we can get back to you on this particular one as to whether where it is on the schedule to be instrumented mm -hmm. um, and yeah. whether it will be or not. But yeah, um, Thank you. And, and actually, you know, these are uninhabited islands, but uh, and I fly over them all the time, going to catching a flight, trying to get to these here back. Airplanes fly over these islands. Yes. And, and, and that's the last thing we need is for one of these volcanoes to explode and hit an airplane. Then we'd be here and say that we had more money. And I'm just – yeah, and we're here for a different reason. Yeah, the, the truth is that our focus has been on inhabited islands. And through a program that we had in conjunction with the FAA, uh, we did have funding we're, yeah, for, we're the for the other aircraft I'm safety. just bringing this up. And, and thank you. But, no, thank you for all the things that you have done um, – NOAA has been a, a good partner in the islands, and USGS too, GS too has done some good for us. Madam Chair, I thank you, and I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman from CNMI, and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the panel, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to begin with uh, Mr. Kennedy and Dr. McNutt. I was interested in your comments about uh, this idea of lack of resources and that resources were directed in other areas outside of research towards the effect of oil spills and specifically in these deep water areas. I'm wondering that in the decision-making process, it seems like to me then that there was some decision about priorities, some decision about risk. I'd be interested for you to tell us then if this scenario, understanding a deep water spill, understanding the effects on the environment in these areas under this sort of condition, what took a higher priority in funding outside of understanding a spill? What directed both of your agencies to say, you know, we're not going to put any more resources to understand what a catastrophic spill may look like in a deep water area, gulf area or otherwise, but we're going to make a decision to direct the resources elsewhere. Tell me, what else out there is a bigger risk? What took priority over understanding the full scope of what a spill like this would create for the Gulf region? That's a tough question. <coughs> However, um, again, I, I, I don't want to over overplay uh, the years of, of being involved in oil spills, but I've been involved for a long time, 25, 30 years. And historically, uh, what you see is a cycle uh, that is exactly where we are now. Uh, this cycle uh, over the course of the majority of my career was about five years. You'd have a major event, uh, then a number of other things would come up. The event was over, you didn't have anything new, you lost the publicity, you had whatever the issues of the day were. And um, certainly there are many that I can think of that, that um, have been pressing and, and concerning us, including climate change, of course, um, but a variety of other things uh, that, that you could list as, as uh, priorities. But uh, with the passage of the Oil Pollution Act and, and um, uh, an extended period of time beyond the five years uh, to where, um, you know, a major – uh, spill is uh, considered 100,000 gallons or more. We haven't had that many major spills uh, since, the oil, uh, since uh, Exxon Valdez, um, and certainly nothing that even uh, begins to approach the Exxon Valdez. And, and so there is uh, a very difficult challenge uh, in any organization. Uh, and when you think of all the all of the challenges in, in say, for instance, NOAA as an agency, uh, oil spill response is one of 100, 200, 300. Uh, and, and to compete uh, w when 
there is some of that lack of urgency and, and the Oil Pollution Act seems to be extremely effective, um, you, have, you have a difficulty. Uh, and so it's not that they, we haven't continued to plug along, we have. Uh, and that's why we have some of the expertise we have today. That's why we have trajectory models that have been quite effective. Um, why we have a damage assessment program that's been out there since the inception of this spill uh, with our other federal and state partners. So it, it's not like we haven't been there, but um, I, I think it's a fact of life that when you don't have a major uh, event, it's a hard time to convince people that it is the most pressing thing until you have the next one. D Dr. McNutt? Uh, yes. Um, the USGS has a very, um, uh, very vigorous hazards program that is quite distinguished in its work in earthquake hazards, volcano hazards, flood hazards, fire hazards, and we can't get through a year, a season, without making major headlines for the lives we've saved and the property we've saved through the forecasting and the hazard reduction through those programs. And the um, good work through those groups and the industries that back them through their efforts by saying, you are helping through your collaborative work with the industries to um, show where hazards are great by working with the industry to make buildings better, by making highways safer, showing people where to build, um, showing how to work in the um, uh, wildland fire uh, urban interface and uh, work to make that zone safer, et cetera, how to uh, help people who are in flood districts um, understand how to mitigate their uh, flood risk, et cetera. Um, whereas when we look at the oil problem, we have the industry telling us over and over again, there is no problem. You don't need to worry about this. Um, uh, uh, ships are safer. Platforms are safer. Drilling is safer. We have everyone telling us that there is no problem. And whereas in the, all these other areas, the industry is working hand in glove with the USGS to help us make those hazards and reduce the hazards. And every season, we find the, the risk happening and the hazards. Um, we, we work to reduce the hazard and make American people safer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. What I would say in this case, though, that um, uh, what the industry was telling you obviously was, was wrong. I thank the gentleman. And now I'd like to uh, recognize one of our more senior members of our subcommittee, um, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kilby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend uh, the witnesses. Um, collectively and individually, uh, I admire you for what you're doing. Uh, knowledge is power. And very often w we have a little or no idea where that knowledge may lead us or how that knowledge may be used. But we must constantly pursue that knowledge. And I've been here in Congress now for 34 years, 12 years in the state legislature, and every year they'll have someone offering an amendment, uh, amending a bill, cutting out this research. Very often it's the reproductive life of some species, and say this is a silly waste of taxpayer money. But we have to be aware, matter of fact, one famous senator, Senator Proxmire, whom, for whom I had other high regard for, but not in this area, I used to award the, the Golden Fleece Award and uh, offer amendments to uh, cut research. But research is extremely important. And what you do, very often you, you may not know where that may lead or how that may be useful, but just research itself and the funding of research is very important. So I commend you for what you, you do. We want to make sure we don't have any intellectual Luddites in the area of research or I in the area of lawmaking. So something that you may have started or one of your partners may have started or your predecessors may have started years ago in research leads on to more and more. And the more we know about the 
the uh, Earth, the planet Earth and that around it uh, is made up, what it's made up of, what its various living organisms can do, the more that can help us in addressing problems. So I just wanted to make a statement that I have great admiration for those of you who really have dedicated yourself uh, to that area of our search for knowledge. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. And uh, I'd like to now recognize uh, Cheryl Shea Porter, gentle lady from New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Mr. Kennedy, I listened with great interest. You said you had about 25 years experience. Am I correct in that? And how long have you worked for NOAA? Um, about 21 years. Okay. So let me just read a little bit of your testimony again. And let me tell you where I'm going with this. I appreciate the fact that everybody's working so hard on this. I appreciate the fact that everybody worked so hard after Valdez. I appreciate the work we do always afterwards. But I need to know, my constituents need to know, Americans need to know why we're always on the job afterwards. What happened between Valdez and now? What was Noah doing? What were these conversations about? Why, why could we be in this mess right now? The more we learn about this, the more disgraceful it is. And you're talking about saying, don't worry, don't worry, oil companies in charge. Th this is of great concern because I thought Noah was in charge of our coastline and protecting our assets. And I thought other federal agencies were in charge. I thought MMS was supposed to be in charge. So I'm trying to look back because otherwise we're going to sit here again. I don't know if it's a year, five years, ten years. We'll be sitting here again and we'll be talking about my personal favorite phrase, lessons learned. Whatever that means, lessons learned. So please let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, you said that NOAA is a natural resource trustee and that's responsible for protecting, assessing, and restoring. Well, if, if it's a natural resource trustee, and you said that you were at hearings, I don't know if Noah held them or you just attended international oil spill conferences, what did you talk about? Did anybody ever say, let me, just, let me add this, did anybody say, like when my boy was 10 years old, he and his friends would get together in a room and imagine the worst thing that could happen? Did you ever talk about the worst thing that could happen? I think we did. Um, and uh, let me just back up and say that uh, Exxon Valdez, uh, we had the same sort of indignation uh, in hearings that I was involved with then uh, that really uh, re resulted in the uh, Oil Pollution Act. Uh, the Oil Pollution Act has a title, uh, a research uh, uh, title, Section 7. Uh, Meetings were held across all of the federal, state, and local academia to talk about what that plan should look like, a research plan. It was developed. Um, we can go back and show you that plan. Uh, for the most part, the investment that would be required to follow through with that from lessons learned uh, never occurred, as far as I know. Uh, did, did NOAA uh, and, and a few others go out and try and do what we could with the resources that we had? We've done long-term studies as a result of the Exxon Valdez, not only looking at cleanup methodologies that worked and didn't work, we actually, during that spill, got um, uh, our federal, state, and local uh, entities to allow us to leave some areas unclean so that we could go back and look. So we've done a variety of things, including as we saw more and more dollars dry up across the rest of the federal agency and industry. There was something called the Marine Spill Response Corporation developed by industry. After uh, Exxon Valdez, this was a, a nationwide effort, 60 to $70 million a year in research and development to, to look at these kinds of things. That lasted for three or four years, and it dried up. We looked at uh, American Petroleum Institute that had money for research. It went away. So what happened, at least in Noah's case, uh, is uh, we developed uh, a, a partnership with the University of New Hampshire and developed a small research I know, unit. And they, and they didn't get money. They haven't received money since 2007. For their Correct. for their coastal cleanup. Correct. So let me let me pull us back into focus again. Mm -hmm. You said it went away, uh, under which administration, and was there any protest? I, it's not good enough to say the money went away. I I feel that if we were, if you knew, and feared this, and others in your job and in these agencies feared that this could happen, 
I think the response should have been a lot larger than it was. I, I hear your frustration, and I'm, I'm glad that you did reports. But I think if the average American had known, and I think it's the job of the federal agencies to be those bulldogs for us and had stood up there and said, hey, guess what? They're putting, they're putting leases out there. We have no idea what to do. And we just thought that the American public needs to know that. It needed to be a very, very public challenge. What we're uncovering right now is astounding, absolutely astounding. And I'm just wondering, were the agencies, the federal agencies that were involved in protecting and assessing, were they ever invited to the table to talk to the oil industry when we had a previous administration developing oil policy? Were federal agencies involved, or was this all just the oil companies making their own decisions, running everything, and telling agencies like yours that, don't worry, we've got it under control? Because if we don't get more aggressive, and if we don't take on the role of guardian, then we will fall victim to this again, and again, and again. So when you had that oil spill conference, was that a central topic? that this could happen, and were there federal agencies there saying, we don't know what to do? We, we've had several hearings now, and the general consensus is that we didn't know enough of what we were doing. We didn't know the impact on the oil. We don't, we don't know if, if this would actually have a blowout. We wouldn't know how to stop it. It's unbelievable what we didn't know. And I talk about the arrogance of moving forward when we don't know this, and now here we are. So at the International Oil Spill Conference, can you tell me who attended? Um, it is a cross-section of everybody, from industry to all the federal agencies to state to academia. Um, it's, it, it, it represents anyone that uh, has an interest or an investment or uh, academic research. Okay, so in the very basic, simple terms, did any of you walk up to any of the guys from the oil industry and say, hey, do you know how to cap a well? I don't recall asking that specific question, but it is a, a forum to get people together to say what is the state of the state and what else needs to be done. Well, yeah, but here's the question, okay? You may talk about oil spills, but did anybody with the oil companies sitting right next to you, right? You're all there together. Did anybody say, does anybody know what to do if we have a problem like this in the Gulf? Was it ever, did you ever have a uh, tabletop model? exercise. I cannot recall that. And d d does that mean it didn't exist or, or didn't get asked that way? Maybe, but I certainly wasn't involved in that and I can't recall it. This seems to me to be the very first question when you start talking about oil spills. Not what do we do and how will we do the science, but how do we prevent it? And so far I am I'm bitterly disappointed that I haven't heard anybody say that we stood up to the oil companies and said, you know what, I don't think you guys know what you're doing yet. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the uh, gentlelady from New Hampshire. Uh, we have a second round of questions here uh, I've been uh, asked, and I do have a few myself. Uh, Dr. McNutt, I have a question for you. This has to do with flow rates. Recognizing that future estimates of natural resource damages will depend on the total estimated volume of oil released, do you think it would have been important to do this at the outset of the spill The, um, ultimately, we will absolutely need to know um, what the flow rate is. I think response uh, is very um, much uh, in all hands on deck, everyone doing the maximum they can, um, and that um, the, um, from what I understand, the uh, ultimate um, response or the ultimate uh, damage recovery will not, not be determined until very far down the road when we actually believe we can calculate what the damage to the environment has been. And uh, we will probably have a very good handle on what the flow rate is at that point because it will all have been captured. So it won't be based on um, looking at video or other calculations, which will probably um, always have uh, uncertainty associated with it. So right. whether we have to know sooner or later, it's, it's going to all be captured at some point, and we'll have a very accurate record at that point. Uh, second question. Is my understanding that scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute 
were ready to take flow measurements, but the project was put on hold during deployment of the containing the containment dome, and BP did not contact these scientists again. If the ability to take these measurements was immediately available, why didn't the federal government ensure that these flow measurements were taken right then and there? Uh, Woods Hole did get two deployments in the field to, uh, with their sonar equipment to calculate flow rate, one prior to the cutting of the riser and another post-cutting of the riser. The uh, calculation, their uh, deployment post-cutting of the riser uh, was with their high-powered sonar, not with also the um, acoustic Doppler current profiler because their contractor had run out of time. Okay, for the record, uh, doctor, I would like to just <laughs> maybe repeat that question. In other words, did BP not contact these scientists again? Yes or no? Uh, I'm not sure about BP. Um, I was working through um, the Coast Guard uh, who had uh, actually contracted with Woods Hole to do the work, and um, the communication with Coast Guard and Woods Hole on the timing of it was uh, very good, and they got in the field, and everything went well. So in other words, it wasn't completed, in, in your opinion, uh, because this is what we have on our record. The, the work was completed. There were delays um, simply because of um, uh, problems cutting the riser so that um, Woods Hole wasn't able to get all the measurements they wanted just because it took more time to cut the riser off than um, had originally been planned. All right. I have another question. Are flow measurements being taken on the oil leaking from the lower marine riser passage cap? Differential pressure um, readings are being taken that will help determine the flow, and we find we will find those. Um, so the answer is useful. yes. Yes. Um, Dr. Cunnington, your testimony stated that approximately one third of MMS collections at the Smithsonian need further work to evaluate the effects of the spill. Uh, what additional steps could be taken to enhance the value of these collections? Well, these are collections that come to us. What MMS does is to contract with uh, various contractors to do the work, and in, the, in that contract it stipulates that the collections will come to the Smithsonian. They come to us uh, in whatever shape they are. In order for us to make them maximally valuable for science, we need to catalog the collections. We need to make sure that all the it's called metadata, which are all the physiographic, all the oceanographic, all the chemical data that's associated with those specimens is attached to each one of those specimens. And there are thousands of those left to go. Where does the funding from this come from? It, for the last 30 years, it has come through a uh, interagency transfer through Mineral Management Services to the Smithsonian. So at a relatively MMS then, mm -hmm. yes. Moderate level, yes. What resources would it take to make all relevant collections publicly available? Uh, we've been working on a budget for that. I think it would be $9 million in two years. Nine, in, in two years, how long? So that answers that question. All right, thank you. I'd like now to turn over the uh, next set of questions to our ranking member, Mr. Cassidy. Uh, Mr. Pincus, is it Dr. or Mrs. Mr. Uh, doctor. Doctor. Um, I see that you were on the oil dispersant task force way back when. Has there been any research that you know of or you can inform us of the, uh, the use of dispersants in the ultra deep? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, there hasn't been almost any research either through a coordinated committee such as the National C Academy of Sciences or by various uh, agencies to study such. And uh, perhaps the reason for that is uh, simply that it has not really been attempted uh, before, or, uh, at least not to my knowledge anyhow. So uh, as I scanned, um, the staff was nice enough to get me the executive summary of y'all's previous of the conference you referenced. As I scanned it, you did have specific recommendations as to research going forward. Um, uh, but the use of dispersants kind of at the well, at the mud line, if you will, was not envisioned. I'm, I'm just curious. I don't know. It was not envisioned or was not felt to, you see where I'm going with that? 
That's right. It, it wasn't envisioned at that time. And not envisioned just because people had serious reservations about it or just because um, they, had other, that they just didn't imagine its need? Uh, I think for both reasons. Um, I, I wasn't uh, directly a part of that committee. I was a reviewer and uh, contributor. Uh, but uh, during part of this discussion, my recollection is that uh, both issues came up. Uh, and do you have concerns about using dispersant at the mud line in the Ultra Deep? Yes, I do. Can you elaborate? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm most concerned because the ability to measure their effectiveness is, is extremely limited. Um, because if they do enter the oil at that depth, the rise time to the surface is in the order of weeks and months, perhaps, which means that you would never know if they worked or didn't work. Now, let me ask you, Ed Overton, though, when I discussed this with him, I mean, he clearly was conflicted. At least I, I interpreted the conflict within his soul because he says you got to break the stuff up. And if you don't have a lot of wave action, you're going to use a heck of a lot more dispersant on the surface. I'm not speaking for him, but my impression was that you know, he accepted the tension. He wasn't sure how he landed on the, on the side of the tension. But what would be your opinion? You know, the, the five, however many barrels forming chocolate mousse on the uh, s surface. So, just your th your your thoughts about that? Well, uh, for a deep sea release, I think the the major problem right now is that we really don't understand enough about it and uh, enough about the emulsion formation. It does appear that the emulsions actually form underneath. So with or without now, now the emulsions form an, that's different from the oil plume of which we've been speaking because I gather the oil plume is actually very dispersed hydrocarbons measured only in parts per million. Do you feel as if there is a uh, chocolate mousse beneath the surface? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, we've seen photos of it. And during the Eshtok spill, we also saw that that chocolate mousse was formed along with regular oil droplets. Um, so is there chocolate mousse under, uh, I just missed that, is there chocolate mousse beneath the surface in this particular spill documented? As I understand, and, and perhaps you might redirect that question. Let me kick it over to Kennedy if you don't mind. <laughs> I, um, I, I think you're right in characterizing the majority of the plume uh, as uh, uh, microscop microscopic uh, droplets uh, and uh, Primarily parts per billion, not million. There are some parts per million, but uh, primarily a lot of the results we're seeing are billions, not millions. Um, there, uh, the moose is more of a surface uh, event, uh, and um, uh, we certainly don't believe that below the immediate surface. Now, now you know, a, a meter or two or three in that range, there could be uh, moose uh, formations, but at depth, we don't think. Let me ask you, it seems like we just, uh, in a very unfortunate way, we have a living lab right now. And clearly what we don't have is a lot of research on these events. Are you currently letting s prospective studies on these effects to academic industry? Frankly, coming from Louisiana, I want my universities involved because I know they'll still be involved in 10 years and haven't moved on to whatever the next crisis is. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, have you, have you involved academic in a prospective well-funded study to look at these effects? And two, have you looked at the ones along the coastal region uh, to specifically go with? Um, we, as you probably know, uh, Ed Overton I has been a contractor for my organization for some time. I was just on a panel with him at the State of the Coast in Baton Rouge last Friday. Uh, and we have them actively involved in uh, doing the analysis of the samples that are being collected. We do have a, a variety of different academic institutions out there working for and but with us. But prospective studies? Correct. I'm pro sorry. Pro prospective studies. Prospective studies. Uh, we had a science summit uh, uh, two weeks ago to look at these very types of issues to develop some longer-term studies. But let me they let have me not been funded. But let me ask. It really seems as if, if the dispersants being li released at the mud line, and we hear from the guy that was on the panel that, well, we, we had concerns about it back at the panel, now is the time to study that. Do you, f do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I, I absolutely do. A and certainly uh, the first uh, the step in studying that is to uh, adequately sample uh, and, and do all the other variety of things, whether it's AUP But in a peer-reviewed study, you would still have to have some sort, I mean, ideally, right now, in parallel, you're not only doing samples at baseline, but you're also coming up with the, with the study criteria, what's my null hypothesis, et cetera, so that you, as soon as you've got your baseline, boom, you've let in an RFP and you've got somebody out there bidding on it. 
Uh, and, and if that particular, what you just described, I I is already completely played out, I don't know. But it, are we thinking about it? We absolutely are. And are we doing the background work right now in terms of sampling, you know, in, in a series of concentric circles around the spill and looking at the subsurface plume so that we have the background data that could lead to that research? We're doing that. I yield back. I thank the gentleman and like to recognize uh, the gentlelady from New Hampshire, Carol Shea Porter. Thank you. As a natural resource trustee organization protecting our coastline, I have to ask a couple more questions about this. You know, children go and take collecting plastic bottles very seriously. And Americans of all ages have worked very, very hard in conservation. And the betrayal that they are experiencing right now, knowing that that agencies, federal agencies and other agencies that were, were charged with protecting the coastline in some way stood at least passively instead of as activists watching what was happening in the Gulf. And this is very painful. This is extremely painful for all of us. So did you have any authority or any voice or any opportunity to comment on the drilling in the Gulf, lease applications, these, these kinds of, uh, of drill designs, anything? Was your agency ever consulted? I, is this, are you directing this at me? Yes. Noah? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, we, we are consulted. We don't have any final authority. Uh, we can't, we, we have no yes, no vote whatsoever. But in, in the uh, processes of looking at leases and, and um, we have the opportunity to talk about our trust resources and, and concerns we may or may not have. So we comment, but uh, that's it, we comment. Do you know if you commented on this particular well or any like this? I'm, I think we may have, but I, I would like to get back to you for the record on that. I, uh, I would like to know. Yes. Can you think of any other, other uh, wells that you may have commented on? Ha have you personally ever written a statement or expressed concern that the oil companies were, were going too quickly and they didn't have the safety procedures and that they might not be able to catch? No, I have not. Did you ever worry about it? I think in the course of understanding how things are, we always worry about an event. We know that anything is possible. Uh, you look at the probabilities, but certainly we've always been concerned about uh, major issues, yes. Okay, so you've been concerned about major issues such as this? In your worst case scenario, could you imagine this? Quite frankly, uh, no. I, I did not uh, think uh, of this one, at least for this duration. I've been involved in other, other blowout situations. I was involved in the Ixtoc spill for a bit. So, I mean, we know that these things can happen, uh, but. When you were commenting on the various wells, did you ever discuss the possibility I mean, as, as if you had a voice, and you said you didn't, you didn't have authority, but you had a voice and an opportunity to comment on this kind of drilling in the Gulf. Uh, my agency has uh, yeah. the opportunity to do that. It's primarily through uh, uh, Endangered Species, Magnuson-Stevens, Marine Mammal Protection Act. None of those things are, are my expertise or my particular organization, but the, uh, the organization does have an opportunity to comment. Yes. Okay, you, where I'm going with this is that I don't know if NOAA expressed concern, reservation. I'm trying to figure out how active your organization was because you are charged with protecting the coastal environment. And clearly, you know, what we're talking about now shows a utter lack of attention to the risk here on the part of many agencies, I might add. And I think uh, that all of us have had a a very sad and ugly wake-up call here about about what we're doing. But did anybody, anybody say to BP, you know, this doesn't look so good, what if? Is that your agency's job to, to comment like that? Our agency's job is, is to comment to MMS in particular when, when they're looking at leases and, and to provide our input and or our concerns. We have expressed concerns about a variety of issues over, over some time, and those have been brought up in some of these hearings. But again, it's not me specifically that can address that. Okay, I would appreciate if you would get back to me then uh, very much. Thank you. And then I just have one last question. 
Uh, was your agency ever consulted about doing that? Um, the USGS is uh, a science agency, so we have um, no management and no policy and no opportunity to say um, yes, no, up and down on anything. So no, we would not have been consulted on this. Um, but l let me take this moment to give you a little bit of perspective on this particular situation simply because having been in this job now um, for about six months, um, I think in a case like this, um, hindsight is 2020. And from the standpoint of the USGS, until April 20th, let me tell you what my life was like. I came into this job in November. And um, for the first two months, it was pretty quiet. And then I had Haiti, Chile, 8.8 .8 earthquake. I had Asian carp invading the Great Lakes. I had a California water crisis that looked like it was going to put the sixth largest economy in the world on its knees. And I had Ayafiatla Yukut that was closing down the most uh, populated air route in the world. And that was still spewing out ash when this well blows up. So to say that, that was this on you know, the USGS radar screen, absolutely not. But you know, we, we were dealing with five crises in my first six months on the job. And let me say, uh, first off, my sympathy, and secondly, we certainly understand from this perspective, too, because that is, that is our world. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady from New Hampshire. I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and I want to uh, tell the panelists today I appreciate you being here. I know that uh, these hearings are going on and on and on about a very important issue, and I appreciate your willingness to come time after time to answer very tough questions. Um, I'd like to start with you, Mr. Kennedy, uh, with regard to NOAA. What is uh, NOAA's position on Governor Bobby Jindal's proposal to build temporary berms to protect the wetlands? Um, we have been involved. There's been, as you're well aware, an interagency uh, discussion and, and comment uh, period uh, throughout the debate. We've been involved. Uh, we've expressed concerns about a, as these uh, berms are built, uh, how that may affect circulation, what it may do to some of our trust resources. Uh, but in the end, um, we have not uh, registered an, an objection that obviously stopped anything. Um, who, who has been the final sort of, uh, apart from the president himself, the, what agency would be the final authority to give the, uh, I guess, the certificate or permission? Is that EPA, the Corps of Engineers? Uh, who has the final say on that? Uh, I believe it's the Corps of Engineers, but uh, I am not the expert there. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the Coast Guard ha has been at the begin at the for forefront of that table to make the ultimate decision. I think you're right, uh, Dr. McNutt. Uh, uh, it, I think it was a tiered thing, Coast, uh, the Corps of Engineers, but ultimately you're right, the Coast Guard, I believe. But uh, I'm not the expert. Do we have a final and complete decision on all of the requests? I know some have been allowed, but uh, I think there may be others that have not. Uh, anything on that? Um, I'm not the authority there, so I, I think the Coast Guard would be the place to ask that. Okay. Um, what lessons did NOAA learn from the Ixtoc uh, 1 deepwater oil spill in 1979 and the explosion of the mega borg off the coast of Galveston, Texas in 1990? Um, I think uh, probably uh, a variety of things, but certainly um, a in those two instances, um, a, a, a weathered oil versus a, uh, a fresh oil have different impacts. When you have uh, uh, oil uh, that comes ashore on sandy beaches uh, as opposed to getting through inlets and back into the marshes, you have a much better opportunity to attack uh, the, uh, the oil and clean it up with, with uh, 
less impact than if you let it get into the inner marshes. A and um, uh, th so those are a couple. Uh, there are others. Uh, uh, one, transport of oil uh, over a long, long distance and the weathering process that takes place, certainly with the Ixtoc, that came from the Bay of Campeche and that's hundreds if not thousands of miles and so on and so forth. So um, like issues like that, I think, uh, but uh, if, you can, if you can isolate the oil on the sandy beaches before I it gets uh, into the back bays and marshes, that's the right thing to do. I think we also had an issue with uh, oil coming ashore, uh, then uh, accreting, uh, gathering sediment and forming tar mats at the base uh, of some of those beaches. Uh, we, we certainly have been looking very carefully at that as a possibility in this spill and have okay. been actually let, let me Let me follow through on sure. that. I appreciate those answers. Um, so what you're saying is early response and then certainly uh, blocking the uh, flow of oil onto the beaches or into the marshes. Uh, it, it's been reported that the Netherlands uh, made available um, uh, all sorts of devices that could have been very effective within three days of the spill, and yet they were not allowed in. Um, and also, again, the berms would have done just the things that you're talking about. So it seems like even though we have the information from those spills, that uh, one in 1990 for, for certain, but it doesn't sound like we implemented any of the knowledge that we learned from it. Well, I think we have. Uh, and in almost every instance, and I talked earlier about the, the complexity and, and the uniqueness of each spill, you'll always have that. So you have to weigh your options. Um, but uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, um, what's gone on here, we have tried to take advantage of some of those things. There's always trade-offs. Uh, and so I'm not at all familiar with the Netherlands uh, uh, advice that you're referring to. Uh, maybe my, I have many, many people on the ground in, in Louisiana and elsewhere. Maybe they have. But uh, we've tried very, very hard to evaluate uh, uh, other options. And, and as you know, there's phone numbers and committees that are trying to look through those. So I'm not familiar with the Netherlands, but beyond that, uh, uh, I think each decision of what we do or don't do is based on a lot of the experience that we bring to the table, and then we're always weighing those options and the trade-offs associated with it. So uh, to some extent, I think we have been using that information. Uh, I can certainly ask more if you uh, – let, let, let me follow up, if you don't mind, just with one maybe half question, and that is – uh, what did we learn about dispersants uh, in those previous disasters? Because it seems that dispersants are controversial, um, and uh, you know we're we're concerned in Louisiana that the dispersants may actually do more harm than good over the long term. So what what have we learned about that that we can apply in this situation? Well, um, I think uh, this and this segues nicely to this idea of trade-offs. I think over a lot of years of research and, and discussion, uh, uh, and this includes um, all of the regional response teams, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that include all of the state agencies right at the table as we make decisions. Uh, we had pre-approval as a result of a lot of what we've learned of dispersants uh, in the Gulf, and we had that because of this trade-off issue. And what we had have determined from a, a lot of the research we've done is if you can keep oil in, in, uh, broken down uh, and off the surface, one, it, it will biodegrade much better uh, uh, than if you let that oil come ashore. Once the oil is ashore, you have a much more significant, serious problem uh, that, that is much harder to deal with, and biologically, uh, socially, socioeconomically, it can be a bigger problem. So if you can disperse at sea uh, at, at appropriate depths, so there's a whole bunch of caveats that go into this, that is the trade-off that actually was accepted by all of the responsible parties uh, in the Gulf some time ago. Uh, I think we stand by that, although we are continually looking when you get the kinds, uh, the numbers of dispersants that have been applied now up into the hundreds of thousands of gallons. We have great co grave concern about that. We actually had a, a small conference in Baton Rouge uh, a couple of weeks ago to to get some of the best experts in the world together to say, okay, with this much dispersant and this much oil in the water column, should we reassess the trade-off? And the, the answer from that, mm -hmm. uh, from that discussion was, I think, th that they thought we were still in a trade-off position that was appropriate to continue to disperse. So we're looking very carefully at it. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chairman.
I thank the gentleman and I wish to thank the witnesses on our first panel for their testimony today. And uh, we'll now call up the second panel of witnesses. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The witnesses on the second panel will be first Dr. Chris Reddy, Associate Scientist and Director of the Coastal Ocean Institute, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Dr. Robert H. Weisberg, Professor of College of Marine Science, University of South Florida. The third witness, Ms. Valerie Ann Lee, Senior Vice President, Environment International Government Limited. The fourth, Dr. Denise J. Reed, Interim Director, the Pontchartrain Institute for Environmental Sciences and Professor, Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, University of New Orleans. And Dr. Christopher Delia, Professor and Dean, School of the Coast and Environment, Louisiana State University. I would like to greet and welcome our second panel of witnesses. And again, note that the red timing light on the table will indicate when five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. We would appreciate your cooperation in complying with these limits. But be assured, all witnesses be assured, that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. Dr. Reddy? Thank you for being here today, and you may begin. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Chairman Burdell, Ranking Member Cassidy, members of the subcommittee. My name is uh, Chris Reddy, and I'm a scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I have studied or currently studying numerous oil spills, including one that still exists in 19 from a 1969 spill, and I'm currently uh, active in the, with the BP spill. And in about a few hours, I'm going to hop on a plane to go on a 12-day research cruise funded by the National Science Foundation to study subsurface plumes. Uh, I'm bringing along um, um, people from the scientists from NOAA, EPA, the Coast Guard, and BP. Last year on the 20th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez accident, I wrote an, an editorial in the, in the Boston Globe about how this country has successfully avoided and managed oil spills since that iconic event. I agree then, and I continue to believe that this country is one of the most experienced and effective in responding to spills. About 10 days after the BP spill, I wrote another editorial in the Boston Globe and quote, I said, as military planners know well, learning lessons from past wars doesn't necessarily help you fight a different kind of enemy. Numerous factors, some unpredictable such as weather and, and some never encountered before will come into play. And as this bill keeps on going, success in combating it will require an unrepresented, unprecedented stamina on the part of both personnel and equipment. I concluded that if the Exxon Valdez was Pearl Harbor, a wake-up call for modern-day oil spills and how to respond to them, then the BP oil spill would be more like the siege of Stalingrad. We are in for a long, exhausting, demanding process of observation, cleanup, and assessment. We need to bring all resources we can to the, to the table. Unfortunately, one of our best resources, academic science, has had a diminishing role in oil spill research in the past two decades. Following the Exxon Valdez spill and other spills, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, or referred to as OPA 90, was passed. This legislation provided a wide framework for diminish diminishing the chances of spills and how to assess damages and restore the environment after a spill. The number of spills has significantly decreased. With the passage of OPA, the approach to damage assessment and restoration has become a well-defined process with legal and economic consequences. NOAA, other federal scientists, consultants, and, contract and contractors now do most of the work. Independent scientists from academia who have the capacity to pursue the outstanding unanswered questions about oil and its interactions with the environment are less often participants in spill science. I have often called this the industrialization of oil spill science. My advice about how to move forward immediately and in the future, NOAA and other agencies should receive continued support to monitor and observe the Gulf Time is invaluable. For example, knowledge about where the oil is, how is it changing, is key to understanding processes acting on the oil, 
and also estimating damages to wildlife exposed to oil. It is paramount that a massive, organized, and sustained effort be directed at researching areas impacted in the Gulf of Mexico. And perhaps one way to think about this is that you might want to think about this oil spill as a crime scene. You want to collect all the evidence, perhaps, in a crime scene before there's a rain or any other type of event. I, I can't underscore the importance of getting such data. It would be unfortunate in the next several years when scientists begin to develop a comprehensive view of the spill that they lament the absence of key data that could have been obtained but was not because of a lack of funds, lack of access, and a lack of political will. Academia is equipped to conduct some of this science but needs direction. I have attended meetings with scientists both at the EPA here in D.C. and down at LSU where there have been many recommendations. The National Science Foundation has commendably provided support to my colleagues via the rapid proposal, and these funds have, been contribu have contributed already. Nevertheless, I believe there could be better coordination between what the academic research is doing and all that needs to be done. I recommend the following actions to be taken forward. I would allow NOAA and other key agencies to triage research, moving it to the top of the list what is most pressing and communicate it broadly, clearly, and effectively to the academic community. It is NOAA and the other federal agencies that are best suited to provide such guidance. They have the experience and they have responded to all the oil spills that haven't been on CNN over the last 200 years, 200, uh, 200 since 19, uh, since the Valdez spill. Uh, and I would also, um, and I would have this, um, this agency of, uh, then I would appoint a panel of uh, science advisors through the UNH Center for Research, uh, Research Center um, and key science stakeholders, and they should use a, a very rapid way to reduce paperwork and get some of this research going very quickly. And I would encourage traditional studies, but also to push towards more advanced techniques. In summary, NOAA and other respondents have been handed an enormous challenge and need all available support. Time is precious. Academia, which has played a minor role in responding to oil spills over the past several decades, should be re-engaged with direction from federal experts who are most knowledgeable about the most pressing problems. Thank you. I uh, thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for your thoughtful input on how to enhance coordination between the federal government and the uh, academic community. Dr. Weisberg, I look forward to your testimony. You may now proceed. Thank you. Uh, honorable representatives, my name is Robert Weisberg from the University of South Florida, and I've been involved from day one with tracking oil at the surface and also uh, performing subsurface tracking of where oil might be going there. Uh, it is my privilege to be here with you today to address the question whether the agencies have the resources to respond. My answer is no, and I will attempt to explain why and also to give a pathway forward. When describing the workings of the ocean, the operant word is connectivity. Connectivity by the ocean is what gives rise to Earth's climate, and is also what gives rise to the Earth's ecology. Without a firm grasp of ocean connectivity, phrases like ecologically based management and marine spatial planning are less than meaningful. The ocean circulation is fundamental to that connectivity. The Loop Current, Florida Current, Gulf Stream system provides the connection between the Gulf of Mexico and the Southeast US. It is a deep water current system, and deep water currents cannot easily extend onto the continental shelf. Thus, the continental shelf circulation differs from the deep ocean circulation, and this results in mechanisms of connectivity that are distinctly different for the continental shelf. The coastal ocean also includes the estuaries, arguably the most productive and fragile of the ocean environments. So my point of these preliminary discussions is that we are dealing with very complex systems, each related through common physics, but each unique in how the governing physics organize to provide the connectivity within and between each region. This is not a simple problem. It does not have unique, simple answers. And that explains why NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service do not have all the resources to respond to the present crisis and why the sub-questions have less than satisfactory answers. So what do we do immediately and into the future? Immediately, we must marshal all of the talent and resources that exist to deal with the environmental crisis at hand. And this requires full partnerships between the agencies, the academics, and the private sector. 
the academic community is an essential, has an essential role in bolstering the resources available to NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the agencies, I would contend, cannot do this by themselves. Data gaps abound, and my written testimony provides specific examples, which I will not repeat here. The fact is, we do not really understand na natural workings of our coastal ocean and estuarine systems well enough because these have not been studied in a truly system-wide, multidisciplinary manner. We are now posed with a fully three-dimensional, time-dependent sampling problem that must take into account the various connections that exist between the deep ocean, the coastal ocean, and the estuaries. This is not business as usual. We must systematically sample our coastal ocean and begin to describe the space-time evolution of critical water properties and sentinel species to assess whether or not post-spill impacts will be occurring and where. So what is the pathway forward? The concept of an integrated ocean observing system, IUS, was advanced by Ocean.us in 2002. This concept remains valid today. Despite the IQUS Act passed in 2009, which authorized IUS within NOAA, the activity languages with little tangible support. And there is more concern for the concept of data management than for the actual implementation of coastal ocean observations and models. And without those observations and models, frankly, there is little need to manage data. It is time to implement the IUs with funding levels sufficient to serve the regions and the nation and with emphases on observations and models. IUs must be approached in a comprehensive, systems-wide, multidisciplinary manner. Regardless of whether the topic is an oil spill, fisheries, harmful algae, the same systems-wide approach is necessary. In other words, to understand our fisheries, we must understand all the connections across space, time, and trophic levels. To describe and predict the present oil spill and its effect on the environment, we must do the same. This is a large task and an evolving one, requiring nurturing and sustenance. There is no point in engaging if there is no commitment to sustain the efforts. There is also a compelling need for familiarity and commitment to one's locale. Local scientists must be involved. Is the effort worth the cost? Our approach to the questions addressed today would be much different if we had IUs in place. So the answer is certainly yes. Moreover, I can testify today from personal experience that the only reason my USF Ocean Circulation Group was able to respond to the crisis as we did is because we had resources in place from previous coups activities supplemented by small competitive research grants. So with some trepidation, I'm also here today to tell you that not all earmarks are bad. In summary, the unprecedented deep horizon oil spill shed an unwanted light on the environmental stewardship of our nation's oceans. An immediate response is required, followed by a stage implementation of an ARCUS concept akin to what was advanced by Ocean.us. I thank you for the in invitation to speak and for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weisberg, for your valuable input on the need for full implementation of an integrated ocean observation system. I'd like now to recognize Ms. Lee. Please begin your testimony. Mr. Cassidy, uh, Acting Ranking Member of the Committee and other members of the Committee. My name is Valerie Lee. I'm the Senior Vice President of Environment International Government Limited. EIGov is a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. Uh, we specialize in environmental consulting. And the controlling service disabled veterans are former Navy officers, one of which who is seated behind me to my right, Mr. Jack Burke. He served in Vietnam as a swift boat captain and was decorated. He and the other owners of the firm support me in our testimony today. Collectively, we share a deep respect for the oceans and the marine environment. And with members of the subcommittee and the people of the Gulf Coast, we would like to assist in any way we can in terms of providing advice, not only to conduct research, but with a point to actually achieve restoration and some measure of making the public whole. It is with great pleasure that I answer the committee's questions as to data gaps and what we can do about them. My background is law. 
science, and engineering. I have written a book uh, along with others, the Natural Resource Damage Assessment Handbook, a legal and technical analysis. So my perspective is a bit different from the others here seated with me today. I'm practical. I've worked with teams of experts for many years, including uh, well-regarded scientists like those seated to my right and to my left. Our specialty is working with interdisciplinary teams in dealing with intractable problems that involve incredibly large data sets like we have today. With that as a backdrop, I'd like to address the committee's questions as to whether or not we have sufficient data and what we can do about it, especially in the subsurface environment. The short answer is no, we don't have sufficient data. The needs are substantial. There are major gaps. The reason why we have substantial needs is not for lack of interest. In part, it is a reflection of us all and what we don't see and what we can't touch, what we can't feel immediately, sometimes is not measured or I should say not given the kind of importance that we would like it to have. In addition, there have been financial limitations. When we look at the current spill, we're looking at the size of an economic and environmental disaster that we have never seen before. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars of damages were we to place an economic value on that which is priceless, the Gulf. Priceless, the lives of the people who are lost, and we express our condolences to the family. We are off the page, we're out of the book, we're learning on the job, we're building a fire truck in the middle of a fire. So what can we do? Is there a lack of hope? The answer is I believe there is hope and it is through science. So what would we do? First, marshal the science as the folks beside me have mentioned or will mention. And also we need to spend some money. Whose money? That is for the Congress to decide. I would argue that there uh, were environmental impact statements done by the oil industry all over the Gulf that could have collected essential data to meaningfully and reasonably understand uh, potential technical uh, impacts, and that was not done. If I look at the size of the, the price tag for meaningful injury assessment, as it's called in the business, and the development of a restoration plan, which is really what this is about, we're looking at over a billion dollars easily. We're looking at the kinds of things which are developing three-dimensional models. It is collecting water samples. Right now, we do not have the vessels in place and the real-time monitoring data to track plumes. We have to collect samples from the subsurface, bring them above, and then send them to the shore for analysis. People sitting in a boat, the scientists don't know where the plume is. They can't react in real time to really measure where it is. And yes, I do believe there are subsurface plumes. The subsurface plumes were documented in uh, a test spill that was done off of Norway in 1999. In addition to having real time information and vessels, uh, the bottom line is, is that we need to do transects of the area and we need to collect information in a way that we have never done before with a thoroughness that we never have. In short, my recommendation would be to activate the Navy and to get a, uh, a group uh, within the, the international community to bring to bear the vessels that we need, the technologies that we need, and we need to get at it quickly. And I have other recommendations in it, including uh, studies related to toxicity in my testimony, uh, but I will submit that for the record and happy to answer questions. Thank you very much uh, for your comments on the natural resource damage assessment process, Ms. Lee. And I'd now like to recognize uh, Dr. Reed. Thank testify. you, Madam Chair, distinguished members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss with you today how we're going to respond to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and what role science and data collection can play. This crisis highlights the importance and vulnerability of coastal systems, and that's why I'm going to focus my remarks today. In Louisiana, this is a coast which was already in trouble, a coast which I've studied for almost 25 years, a coast which we understand well 
and which we think can be restored even in the face of current events. I'd like to touch on five things this morning. One of the specific challenges for assessing the damages associated with the current oil spill will be separating out the effects of the oil spill from the long-term changes that are already going on at the coast. In, for Louisiana, anyway, we will need to predict how the future of this coastal ecosystem has been changed by the oiling and by the dispersants and by any other response efforts. Uh, we know that if some onshore response efforts are not conducted carefully, they can cause more damage than the oil on the surface. I re recommend uh, specific investments in predicting the future of these impacted coastal ecosystems so that we can separate out the effects of the Deepwater Horizon from the ongoing ecosystem restoration. The system will be in worse shape in the future. The question is how much of that can be attributed to the oil. My second point, uh, the concept that oil is easier to clean up in sandy environments compared to muddy wetlands is well accepted. We've already heard that this morning. This premise, well accepted premise, has led to calls for action at the outer shoreline to reinforce the sandy perimeter of the Louisiana coast and to limit the tidal passes. Sand berms, rocks, barges have all been proposed. How well these measures will work remains to be seen. Hard structures like rocks are not a natural feature on the Louisiana shoreline. And our history has shown that rocks and breakwaters disrupt the natural sand movement and prevent natural healing which can, can occur on our barrier islands after storm events. We must be wary of causing long-term harm to the system with our emergency response measures, especially where that harm can be avoided or where it likely outweighs the effects that it could have in terms of our ability to contain the oil, a trade-off that's already been discussed. I recommend increased efforts to specifically track the performance and effects of response measures in the coastal area to allow the implementation of additional measures if necessary, if the ones that we have are failing, and to make sure that we assess the total impact of the event here. We must not be complacent, we must monitor, and we must try not to do more harm than the oil. Oil will move into the estuary. All agree that containment and removal in open water is far preferable than letting the oil get into the wetlands. However, there are thousands of potential destinations that the oil could get to. Those on the ground trying to respond can more effectively mobilize and deploy the booms and skimmers that they have if they have better information on the potential paths of oil movement within these complex and shallow bay systems. University re researchers are already using their existing computer models to produce maps for local authorities of the surface and mid-depth currents within the estuary to aid the local people on the ground in preparing for where the oil might move. The actual movement of the oil on any particular day is going to depend on local wind and tide conditions, but these kinds of tools have been very helpful to them in thinking about where it might go. I recommend increased utilization of predictive, predictive models of shallow water movement to inform the on-the-ground response on the coast. Water movement in shallow bays is rarely predicted by models which focus on the entire Gulf of Mexico. Wetlands are only one part of the coastal ecosystem. In the open water areas, both in the bay bottoms and the water columns, and I'm talking about the shallow water areas behind the barrier islands now, not the open gulf. In those areas, oil, even in low concentrations, can be having an effect which is much less obvious than the coating of beaches or wildlife or marsh grass. What happens in the open water is crucial to the food web and to many of the species that we value as commercially and recreationally important. A typical fish life cycle starts with eggs, goes to larvae, goes to juveniles, and eventually to adults. These different stages show major changes in their physiology, behavior, where they live, where they hang out, what they eat, and in their susceptibility to oil, with the early life stages being much more sensitive. I recommend an increased emphasis on measuring and understanding the effects in open inshore waters of low concentrations of oil, especially on lower parts of the food chain and the early life history stages of these commercially important species. We have to measure what we cannot easily see. And lastly, the unprecedented extent of this event has led to a massive data collection effort using a variety of sensors and data collection techniques. Making these data available 
to interested scientists and stakeholders would increase understanding of the ever-changing effects and allow a wider range of experts, including university scientists like myself and the others assembled here, to communicate with the public on the, on the effects of this oil. I recommend increased access to agency collected data through an easily accessible data management system. The new GEO platform, which was released yesterday, is a good start. We can see the maps, we can see where the oil has been, where it isn't, but we need to see the actual data and work with that too. It's going to take all of us to understand this thing. I speak on behalf of many when I say that university researchers are ready to help and apply the tools and knowledges that we have to support this emergency. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. This concludes my remarks. I'll be happy to take I thank you uh, very much, Dr. Reed. And Dr. Delia, we will hear from you now. Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member Cassidy and members of the subcommittee, my name is Chris Delia, and I'm a professor and the dean of the School of the Coast and Environment at Louisiana State University. I welcome this opportunity to be here with you today. Federal research, research and monitoring assets are critically important at this time of national crisis. The academic community and private sector want to contribute more also. Universities like LSU depend heavily on federal funding to undertake their research. Unfortunately, significant federal funding uh, has been slow to materialize as this crisis evolves. Here are some concerns. Serious existing gaps exist in observational data needed to predict the extent and trajectory of the oil spill. The Integrated Ocean Observing System, IUS, a federal, regional, and private sector partnership for collecting, delivering, and using such information needs more federal funding. The Gulf of Mexico has until recently had, had very poor coverage by high-frequency or HF radars that provide real-time data on the direction and strength of surface currents. The NOAA IOS office helped relocate three HF radar units to provide coverage of a portion of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida continental shelf, but the Louisiana coast, including the Mississippi Delta region, still has no HF uh, radar coverage. This is unacceptable. Large-scale regional models are critical to understanding Gulf circulation, but they are not particularly useful for nearshore predictions of the fate of oil. LSU scientists have excellent fine scale nearshore and estuarine monitors, models that need to be adapted and interfaced with regional scale circulation models of the Gulf. This, of course, takes funding. I would like also to uh, comment briefly on the adequacy of pre and post impact spill data needed for conducting national, natural resource uh, damage assessments. For many years, LSU has occupied many research sites in the wetlands, coastal uh, embayments, and estuaries along the Louisiana coast. Pre-impact data obtained at these sites will be extremely useful for spill impact assessments. We await being informed of a mechanism by which we can apply for significant federal funding for continued data connect collection. It is nearly two months now since the spill began. Bernard assessments uh, are important for recovery of damages from the spill. However, many scientists believe that important information must also be uh, obtained outside of this process. One senior faculty member in my school expressed it as follows. I haven't much time left in my career, and I would prefer not to spend it in court. Others have told me that the legal burden, burden added by the process actually impedes good science and means that state-of-the-art scientific approaches are not used. And I think Dr. Reddy was implying that. Uh, most present research seems to be focused on offshore concerns pertaining to the fate and effects of oil and dispersants. These are important concerns, but we not, must not forget that the Louisiana coastal environment is particularly vulnerable and threatened. Louisiana's extensive wetlands constitute approximately 40 percent of the national total, and the state is second only to Alaska in terms of seafood production. We must accelerate our efforts to understand the impacts of this dreadful spill on these living resources. Louisiana is the focal point of the fertile fisheries crescent that extends east and west into all or parts of Mississippi and Texas. We do not know what the effect of oil and dispersants will be on this food chain, as uh, my colleague sitting to the right mentioned. 
i offer the following recommendation we need a comprehensive still science plan that includes the academic community we do not have one now federal agencies need better ways to get emergency funding to researchers as someone mentioned the national science foundation has rapid awards which have been extremely valuable uh, and no also has a sea grant program which has program development awards such emergency programs need more resources as of june eleven a search on www.grants.gov did not return any results for oil spills. This seems remarkable to me. Communication with and within the academic community should be enhanced. EPA Administrator Jackson did come down to meet with us early on, which we appreciated greatly. I recommend that more such contact occurs with more communiques from agency leaders to university leaders and scientists. Ship time is difficult to find, schedule, and pay for. Better coordination mechanisms would be very helpful. Human impacts have received inadequate attention at the federal level. More attention need, needs to be paid to those. Finally, we need new ways to finance sustained research and observation on the inevitable conflicts between energy and environment. A federal Gulf oil trust should be established. Senator Landrieu, has recently introduced legislation to allow Gulf Coast states to share the revenue from offshore oil and, nat and natural gas drilling. I think that and other mechanisms should be considered. Thank you for your attention. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. D'Elia, uh, for your comments and your recommendations. And I will now recognize uh, members, beginning with myself, for any questions that uh, May, we may wish to ask. First, I'd like to begin with you, um, and, and I do want to say this of this panel. I uh, appreciate your honesty. It's been very refreshing. We uh, know the problems, we've heard the problems, and you admit to them. And so uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, following up with my question to Dr. McNutt earlier, after the containment dome failed, did BP recontact scientists from Woods Hole to take flow measurements? Yes or no? To my, to my knowledge, no. Thank you. Also, uh, Dr. Reddy, do flow measurement technologies exist that can be used to estimate the total spill volume from this oil spill? The technologies that's been used so far have been uh, modified from other previous knowledge, I believe. Um, I, I do not believe there's a known set in place um, technology that is used for such questions. Um, but I, that's not a little bit outside my expertise. I see. Well, how quickly can these measurements be made? And do you think these measurements could have been made without interfering with response and recovery activities? I believe the numbers that uh, uh, Dr. McNutt has put together as part of her working group are, are, are pretty robust. Um, they include from, and what's particularly interesting from them is that they've come from a variety of different angles um, and they seem to be all in the same um, ballpark. Um, and the, the values that my colleagues uh, collected more recently um, on a vessel, um, on a BP vessel, I, I think are, are more particularly strong. I, I would like to make one comment on, on these estimates. Uh, we're never going to get a number that's 53.5 um, or anything like that. Um, my personal opinion is if we could nail down an estimate in the ballpark of uh, within a factor of two or a factor of three, um, considering all the other uncertainties that are in play with this uh, very large event, I think that would be a, uh, a sound number. Why is it important to have an estimate of the total volume of oil released into the environment? From a scientific perspective, we want to um, have a mass balance. Um, to take that out of scientific jargon, that's essentially we want to, we want to uh, um, balance our checkbook. We want to know where all the oil went. We want to know what got biodegraded, what evaporated, what may have gone into the sediments, what would have gone into the marshes. So in a couple of years, when we start to um, look at all this data, comprehensively with a team of interdisciplinary action, a team of interdisciplinary scientists who will want to start looking closely where everything is, kind of have our own little, um, for example, for lack of a better term, uh, um, 
boxes of where oil was and we would hopefully try to uh, balance those checkbooks. If we don't know how much came out, then we may be missing something. Uh, Dr. Weisberg, it is clear that the worst case scenario for an oil spill is how much worse than previously imagined. Can you suggest how the federal government and scientists could better respond to events of this scale and complexity? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to respond to that. Um, there was a comment made earlier that had we had enough resources in place based on previous experience, then perhaps we wouldn't be in the position we're in right now. Um, and so I think we have to respond with that in mind. There's an immediate crisis right now that obviously requires being dealt with. But we have to lay down for the future resources so that we can deal with crises like this better in, into the future. Uh, Ms. Lee, do we have enough economic and social data to adequately assess the impacts of lost use and access to natural resources? We have sufficient, well, let me say this, we have a, a substantial body of data uh, in terms of lost uses, the kinds of things that you would be looking at is you would be <coughs> looking at um, uh, bookings and what has been canceled. And what is different about this spill, this is an area where we probably have more information than we did in other spills. So it's one bright light in terms of the assessment. Because people have booked more on the Internet, it's easier to see a change uh, from baseline, if you will. So in terms of lost use, uh, as far as things like uh, recreation, yes, we have some better data than we have in prior spills. With respect to things like lost uses for uh, fishery resources and so on, no, we don't uh, because we need to know changes in populations and have a sense of how it's going to affect um, the industries over, over the longer term. And therein gets back to the scientific data that people have been talking about, the experts here at this table, which is to try to collect information so that we can see a change. A lot has been uh, uh, said about baseline. I take a very, uh, a slightly different perspective on baseline. I believe you can show injury without knowing exactly what was there before. And you do that by virtue of showing where the oil is, uh, what has been exposed to the oil, and then considering toxicity. Now, we definitely need more toxicity studies, but we also can collect information that's out there in the literature and bring it together, and that's where the scientific community is incredibly important. So with respect to those lost human uses, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I also have another question for you. You state in your testimony uh, that, and I quote, the law cannot achieve a compensation to make the public truly whole. Can you please elaborate on this statement? I believe that the damages are so huge on this were we to truly value it um, that there's probably not enough money to actually pay for it. And also there are certain fundamentals that really can't be compensated uh, with money. Fundamentally, the question is, can we restore the environment and bring it back so that the fishermen can fish and lives can be put back together? And the answer is the jury is still out on that, no pun intended. So when I look at the law, I see that the most important thing that we all could do, at least among us here at this table, is to focus on the fundamentals of science, to focus on the fundamentals of technical analysis, and put our, uh, ta our energy and task towards trying to get it better. The Justice Department can attempt to address uh, the injury in terms of economic value, but I've been told by an economist once before, that which is priceless is valueless. And unfortunately, we're almost in that situation. I truly am worried about the Gulf. Uh, I'm less worried about how much money the government might collect I'm more worried about can we direct our resources to the place it needs to be to put back the lives of the people on the Gulf Coast, the industry, and the ecosystem. Uh, thank you. I, um, we have a panel of scientists here. 
all experts in their field, uh, when they talk about it, you read about this oil spill, they say, well, the recovery will be a decade, several decades, many decades. Can anybody answer? Uh, I know we can't put a firm number on this, but will it be many, many decades before all is, or at least partially normal? May I respond? Yes. Um, I believe, and I heard this morning somebody say uh, that recovery would be a very, very long time. Um, it's my opinion that any estimate at this point beyond what we see on the short term and perhaps some estimates in terms of what we're seeing, uh, anything, any type of quali quantifier is scientifically imprudent, and it frustrates me to hear them do so. Um, we will have a much better perspective about the long-term impacts of this bill as data comes along and where experts get to sit down from a variety of different disciplines to get a, an idea and a perspective. And this is by no means giving BP a free, a free pass at all. But, um, and then we also have to put this in the context of scale. Um, we often hear people talk very, very long, long time, and they put in the context of the whole Gulf of Mexico. It is quite possible that there will be impacts for a long time, but they may be in, in small aspects mm. of the ecosystem. So I, I would say this time, let's slow down, let's collect the data, let's be prudent, and, and, and in the pipeline, we will be able to have much more robust estimates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to the um, ranking member, Mr. Cassidy. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, I just whispered to staff that we are going to go on a bipartisan basis to try and have some of that BP money that we're going to put in escrow, fund proactive research that will be put out on an NSF rapid response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Uh, you've informed me. Uh, and and I'm, I'm so confident, I mentioned it here because I'm so confident that Ranking Member Bradaya will support that. Um, also, Dr. Weisberg, I promise you that Dr. Belia also believes in earmarks and has also assured me that they can be really good things. And so I've heard from my own uh, constituents. Um, uh, I'm a doctor. I'm actually on faculty with LSU Medical School. I'm an academic. I know that oftentimes we as researchers hold our data we don't release it because we want to make the big splash at the meeting. One thing Michael J. Fox did, which I thought was very wise in healthcare, is when he started his foundation to promote research into Parkinson's disease, he demanded that it be released real time. It may be a little dirty, it may not be quite where it should be, but it's not going to be encumbered for three years while kind of polish and goes to a meeting. Now let me ask you, in your field, in your academia, is data typically impounded? I've learned from Dr. Leah that some of the, from his colleagues at Exxon Valdez, some of them have data which is still not released because of threat of court order. Let me ask you, what solutions do we have so there can be real-time release? If we're successful at getting money for proactive research, credit yourself for putting the idea there. But secondly, let me ask the whole panel, what do we do? Do we know that that research has a maximal impact upon the ability of the Gulf to heal itself? One, is it a problem in your, in your area of academia? And two, how do we address it? Dr. Weisberg? Well, you know, I mentioned IUs on several occasions, and one of the hallmarks of IUs is that the data be open access. And so, and IUs, what is an IU? I'm sorry. The in Integrated Ocean Observing System that was originally yeah. promoted by Ocean.us and endorsed by the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. Um, and so, yes, we, we share your concern, and that was a, a part of the IUs concept, o open access data. My experience so far with the Deep Horizon oil spill has been whatever I've produced has gone out on the Internet and has gone in briefing PowerPoint to anybody I thought could use this, but my information flow has been a one-way street. I have not gotten information back that I think is critical. Back from whom? From any of the agencies. Now, I the heard Unified earlier one of our speakers, I think it was one of the women, mentioned that the uh, NOAA has been putting stuff out, or maybe you, Dr. Reddy, um, that NOAA has been putting out stuff real time. Is that, is there, is, let me ask you, in context of that, uh, continue. No, Dr. Weisberg. Yes. So one of the things that I've been doing specifically is providing spill trajectories at the surface and also attempting to do subsurface tracking, not knowing where the oil may be. Um, 
we use satellite imagery interpretations of where the oil is to reinitialize on a daily basis the location of the oil without which these forecasts are useless on a cloudy day we have no satellite imagery the unified command they have over flights they have a lot of other access to information on where the oil is and yet there is not any a provision to provide that information to people like me and so one of my immediate suggestions in my written testimony is that be provided immediately so that we any of us that are engaged in spill trajectory forecasts can provide more accurate products that's 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 one example dr. Reed you spoke of I think it was you spoke of the geo um, is is again I'm learning so I, I, I'm not asking you questions to challenge I'm asking you questions to learn the geo doesn't have an adequate uh, doesn't have this data in an adequate amount or help me out here yesterday Noah announced uh, uh, a website called geoplatform.gov where you can go and see uh, a variety of data uh, related to this event. Uh, it includes uh, images from NASA, it includes the surveys on the ground from the SCAT teams about where they've seen oil and where they haven't seen oil. It includes information that's been put together in terms of supporting the response. Um, it's a a geospatial platform, you go in and you see maps and you, you use different layers. You can't actually access the data though. You can see it, but you can't actually have it and take it and put it in your computer and analyze it in a different way, which is which is what would, that would be a database that would. Michael J. Fox would say, put the data out there so you can download the database and you can play with it. Yeah, and I understand that that, that is in process at the moment. I had some discussions with Noah on this, and I do believe that is in process, but that really needs to be moved out as quickly as possible so that we can do analysis, we can assist with understanding what is going on. There's so much going on that we can't just rely on the government scientists to do everything. We have to be able to play our role too. And so making that data accessible is going to be important. I do recognize, though, that some of the data that's being collected is going to be kept aside as part of the as official assessment, and that may not be available. But there's a huge amount of data collection out there that's guiding response, as opposed to really establishing this legal baseline that we could really use. And uh, there was a second round. Uh, there's not a second round of questions. I'll yield back and come back uh, a couple more. I thank the gentleman, and now I'd like to um, ask for a unanimous consent that the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Gus Villarakis, be allowed to join us on the dais for this hearing. And hearing no objection, so ordered. And I'd like to now recognize the gentleman from Florida. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. And I apologize for being late. Some of these questions may have been asked, but I feel that they're important. Uh, so I'd like to begin by uh, <coughs> Again, thanking uh, the panelists for your excellent and informative testimony. And a special welcome to Dr. Weisberg from the University of South Florida. While not directly uh, from my district, Dr. Weisberg, in conjunction with USF, an institution that I've long admired and endeavored to, to assist, has been very helpful to me, uh, in particular by coming to my office and personally briefing me, as well as taking the time to consistently brief my m members of my staff. Thank you, Doctor. I thank you for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. And really, this is the crux of the, my question, the sharing of information. It is irrefutable that you alone at USF were the first person hours after the tragic explosion of the Deepwater Horizon rig to engage instruments you already had placed out in the field. These are the same instruments that you had deployed as far back as 1993 to help set up a, a, your numerical calculation model. As I understand it, you have been prodding NOAA and other a government agencies for years to be better prepared for scenarios just like the one we're facing today. Since April 21st, 2010, you have shared your uh, information with government agencies. Has the government reciprocated by sharing information that they have gathered? And your testimony, you say that uh, data gaps abound. You suggested that uh, satellite data could be supplemented by other, other means, and again, a quote, ground truth. But again, that information has not been shared with me, with you, as I understand. Uh, that's disconcerting to me. 
who is not sharing the data that can better assist you to help fight this environmental and economic nightmare? What can Congress do uh, to compel the sharing of information and to make uh, sure that the new data is, uh, exists? Uh, I can, if you can answer that question, I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a tough one to, to answer, but I, I will, and I'll try to be very candid, and um, we'll see where this goes. Uh, first of all, I, I was involved from day one. However, I'm sure I was not the only one, so let me just make it very clear. There have been a lot of people involved, and, and I'm one of them, and I happen to have an excellent staff that, and some resources in place that allowed me to do that, and I'm very thankful for that. However, my group has received absolutely no resources from day one, so we're doing this out of, out of professional responsibility. And uh, I feel that if I'm privileged enough to be a professor at a university and to be engaged in what I do, then I have a responsibility to respond as best I can, so that's what I did. Um, I have been frustrated from the beginning that the flow of information has not been as good as I'd like it to be. And in particular, the reinitialization of these trajectory models with actual oil rotations. As I said, all I have available to me are the analyses that my gifted colleagues can do at USF in identifying in satellite images where oil may be. It's not an easy, uh, an easy task. Um, nobody has asked me where, to, nobody has asked my recommendations on where overflight should go. There's been no discussion whatsoever between anyone in my group as to how maybe we can assist better. And therefore, I'm frustrated that I think I could do a better job of what I'm doing if there was an information flow to me. And that has not occurred 57 days into this tragedy. Um, that's a pretty strong statement, but I think it's important to, to make. As far as other observations go, we've heard today about um, high-frequency radar, and I've made a point in my testimony to say that there is no single instrument system that's adequate. There's no single model that's adequate. This is a complex problem. This is very broad. This is not a problem for NOAA, not a problem for the EPA, not a problem for the MMS. This is a universal problem, and we have to begin approaching it in a more comprehensive manner. Otherwise, we're just not going to understand how our systems work, and if we don't understand how our systems work, we cannot project well into the future as to what the results of this crisis might be. So we have to reevaluate how we do our science in the coastal ocean for the betterment of society. I hope that at least begins to answer your question. What if I help facilitate that information flow with the United Command in St. Petersburg? Would that be helpful? Uh, yes, it would. Very good. Thank you. A couple more questions, if I may, Madam Chair. In your testimony, Dr. Weisberg, uh, you say that, and I quote, scoping out the nature of the potential subsurface threat as quickly as possible is necessary for contingency planning and possible mitigation. Tell me why that's important. We have heard all along that the Unified Command, which includes BP, Coast Guard, NOAA, EPA, and Interior, say that the flow rate of the oil coming out of the well head is irrelevant because they are treating this as a worst case scenario. Does the oil flow matter at this juncture and how we should be responding to the disaster? And other members of the panel are welcome to join in as well. But first to you, Doctor. Well, let me, let me treat the last question first. I, I think the flow rate does matter. If for no other reason than to have been prepared with a surface vessel that can capture more than 15 thousand barrels per day. If they knew it was 25,000 barrels per day, then why didn't they have a, a surface vessel brought in that can handle 25,000 barrels per day? So, but getting back to subsurface oil, the ocean circulation and the whole organization of, e of ecology is a fully three-dimensional problem. For example, as oil is now approaching Florida and, and, and has started to hit Flor West, northwest Florida beaches, we know that the region of the continental shelf break where the depth all of a sudden drops off into the abyss. We know that that's a very sensitive region for all of our reef fish. In fact, that's where gad grouper live as adults and that's where they spawn. And so if there are contaminants in levels high enough with toxicity large enough to impact those communities, and I don't know, but if there is, 
We need to know about that because the worst thing we can do then is wipe out the, the fundamental habitat of our reef fishery. And so just because we don't see it, just because it's below the surface we don't see it, does not mean it's not a threat. It may even be a, a worse threat than what we can see. Thank you. Other members of the panel, would you like to address it? Does, he, does the flow matter? Yes, I think it does. I mean, uh, certainly the mass matters what's out there. And, the, and maybe the answer was in relation to what they would do to clean it up. And there's limited assets so that you can only clean up so much. But it very much matters with respect to injury assessment. And I would like to, to, to remind the committee again about restoration. I would like to submit that all is not completely lost, that it isn't just about preparing for the next spill and having research to count, count the organisms that have died. I'd like to suggest that if we're smart about uh, collecting the information, and let's not even call it research, let's call it appropriate technical response to the spill. Let's analyze what's happening. Let's make some reasonable conclusions, maybe not to the 95% degree of certainty that scientists love, but to the degree of certainty that we need as policymakers and people who are trying desperately to make sure that we have a gulf and a vibrant economy in the near term rather than decades out. So I think it does matter, and it matters for restoration. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to comment. Uh, I think flow absolutely does matter. We should understand it. It's going to be important to know how much is out there because the effects will be uh, determined by how much is there. But it's also important to know how it is partitioned, where it goes. The fate of the oil is extremely critical. If they're using dispersants, it may send it in one direction. If they don't use dispersants, it may send it in another direction. So all of these things are important. I think as uh, uh, Marsha McNutt indicated in the previous panel, uh, the doing the mass balance is an extremely critical activity that we need to undertake. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. I yield back. There is another round, is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Reed, in collecting data about the inventory and condition of natural resources as part of the natural resources damage assessment, is it helpful to involve local programs that may have extensive data and local knowledge about impacted resources, and how do you involve these local or state entities? I think it's absolutely crucial, ma'am. One of the points I wanted to make about the Louisiana coast uh, and the issue of a baseline is that it is constantly changing anyway. If we were to go out and collect a large amount of data in 2010, that would really not give us a good idea about what it was like in 2008 or what it would be like in 2012 because it is constantly changing. And that's exactly why we need to not just go out and look at what it's like now, but we need to engage folks who've been tracking it over the last few decades to show what path it was currently taking. Where were areas eroding already? How was the grass growing to begin with? You know, was this a bad year? Was this a good year? And so really engaging those folks that have had studies on the ground, particularly in the wetlands, in the barrier systems, in the open bays, these complex environments where we're not going to be able to go out and measure every little piece of it. We need to bring those of us together who have studied it for a while and lay their data on the table. And I think most people are willing to do that. Thank you. Uh, and I agree with you. The experience that these folks bring with them would be very, very helpful. Uh, what kind of monitoring is needed to understand the oil and dispersant impacts on important fish populations uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and what would be needed to implement this kind of monitoring? Uh, I think it's, a, it's both a research and monitoring question, and I, we, we obviously want to do the fundamental toxicity studies that uh, one always does and taking into account the, uh, uh, the different life stages the fish are involved with, as Dr. Reed suggested. So that will be very, very important. But we also need to understand, whenever you work with a pollutant, you have to understand dose and exposure. And uh, so trying to understand what the dose is, uh, referring to, yes, uh, to Mr. DeRoch's previous question, is going to be very, very important. And how long that, uh, that dose stays resident, how long these various life stages of organisms are going to be affected. Uh, we want to understand the ecosystem. We want to understand the trophic relationships. 
if we do something that causes a catastrophic failure of the trophic uh, dynamics, if you will, of the uh, coastal shelf, it could have a devastating effect that could last for years. If we destroy the ability of fishes and shellfish to recruit uh, uh, future generations, then we're going to have a serious problem. These questions are all up for grabs. We need to be studying them now. We need to be planning our studies now. We cannot wait and, and, and hope that later on we can begin these things. And Dr. Bialia, do you think that NOAA should establish an emergency funding program similar to the National Science Foundation's rapid re awards for immediate collection of ocean observation and environmental baseline data in the event of an oil spill? Absolutely, or the, in the event of another uh, catastrophic environmental uh, a concern that they might uh, they might have, there is an, uh, an a mechanism right now. Uh, as a former Sea Grant director, I'm always proud of what the Sea Grant program does. They have a small pot of money called program development money that is used for that purpose, but it's a very small pot of money. It's limited to I think about ten thousand dollars a shot. Mm. That's simply not enough to do a substantial, credible amount of work. Uh, the NSF rapid program goes up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and is really a much better, uh, much better approach. Uh, so, uh, frankly, Sea Grant has been underfunded uh, for as long as I can remember, and it's an extraordinarily important program. Thank you very much, and I'd like now to uh, call on the ranking member. Doctors Delia and Reddy, is it possible BP has said they're going to make everybody whole insofar as they can make people whole? Is it possible to, let me ask the two of you, is it possible that BP could do so if we don't have prospective ongoing research as to the, again, ongoing effects of this spill? Dr. Reddy? No. Yeah, it doesn't seem right, huh? I, I, I just want to get that for the record because. Sorry, uh, I'm, Dr. I'm Dr. not being fresh. <laughs> no. Yeah, Dr. Lee. I, I would agree uh, completely. Okay, let me go on to the next one. Let me ask the two of you to rate NOAA's response or any federal agency's involvement right now of academia. Because you're obviously doing some work with them, but in general, rate, uh, I already heard from Weisberg, um, it's an F. Um, if you please rate what you think the federal government's response has been so far engaging in this kind of prospective RFP. Engaging me directly? Yeah. Uh, I've had the luxury to speak to NOAA frequently. In fact, I'm planning for this cruise that I'm leaving uh, in a few hours for. I have looked at the data that has been released quite quickly and has we have used that to make our cruise plans um, upcoming so so I, I consider uh, the fact that there has been a lot of transparent data recently uh, there's a website for us to see where every vessel that's in the theater is out there and every research vessel now that is in the theater has to update a data um, of the data that has been out there in terms of collection of data and some other raw data that we are using as we speak so Woods Hole has had a good experience uh, uh, myself in uh, in interacting with uh, NOAA and the EPA as well in terms of recently planning our data, our crews. Dr. Lee? I'd say that uh, for both uh, NOAA and EPA, the experiences are mixed, and that's because uh, both agencies have regulatory and operational responsibilities, and we tend to, in the academic world to be much more oriented to research. And it, it is always the case that if you have to regulate or do something operational, uh, like forecast the weather, uh, you're going to make those your highest priority. So as a result, NOAA and EPA both tend to be agency-centric to a certain degree, and that's partially the complexity of their mission. Uh, it would be nice if we could have a way of partitioning out the research that each agency does so that it is better protected. Years ago uh, in Congress, there was a proposal to establish a National Institute for the Environment to do exactly that, but it went nowhere. Uh, so that that's a fundamental challenge for NOAA, for EPA, and for the academic community. Ms. Lee, again, I've, uh, Dr. Weisberg? Yes, I'd just like to just clarify one point. Um, I have not received any direct flow of information or support from NOAA for this. However, I have interacted with a limited number of NOAA scientists, and NOAA does acknowledge the work that we're providing on their daily forecast. So it's not as if there's been no you know, linkages. Um, I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee. I would agree with that also, uh, Congressman. Ms. Lee, um, again, I, I remember, again, I'm being so struck by somebody who worked in Exxon Valdez, says that his 
research is still encumbered however many years later because of litigation issues and it's subpoenaed, et cetera. When I spoke to some of the researchers, they said when they went to the marshes, they were confronted by somebody, they said from BP, I've learned in this job to say what I've been told, not what I know. That, that took them kind of their name, where are you from, if you publish anything, we're going to subpoena you sort of thing, which is an intimidation for an academic who just wants to get along with their life. Um, so that said, as the lawyer on the panel, um, what can we do to allow folks like you to do your research without fear of being intimidated by the legal process? Well, that's a challenging question, and I think the bottom line is that in some ways there needs to be a par parallel process. So to the extent that one uh, wants to get compensation, and I believe there's clearly a case here that's substantial, then one does need to recognize the, the limitations of the law. The limitation uh, that we have presented is it is an adversarial process, and information can be used um, in ways uh, I think it's inappropriate for somebody to be threatening uh, subpoenas. And, and it may just have been that it was taken as a threat and wasn't intended to be. Correct. But still. However, I will share with you, um, I was working on a matter in the state of Maine and uh, had occasion to speak with someone from the agencies, and the damage assessment team from that agency actually was given the same story. Um, they ignored it. Uh, and I certainly have read with interest uh, the statements made by members of the press Obviously, the beaches are public, um, and people have access to pe beaches. There is a legitimate concern to the extent that there is a hazardous situation, but at this point, we can't declare the entire Gulf Coast a hazardous waste site. I think I heard a kind of presentation of problem by you, but not a real solution. Now, I'm a physician. I typically don't like attorneys. <laughs> uh, but that said, is there a solution to this? Well, there is a solution. Uh, one is there needs to be a transparent and public process. Two, that there is a role for the Department of Justice working on behalf of the United States to prepare a case. Third, um, I do believe that the data that uh, was collected in, in Exxon Valdez, we should revisit that issue. I'm aware of actually, when I was at the Department of Justice, which I was, uh, experts who were working on Exxon Valdez were actually literally to, to get rid of their notes uh, by the criminal division. So that's the kind of thing that mm, there may be a basis for it in law, but the bottom line is, is that that's not very helpful for the larger public interest. And I'm a different kind of lawyer. Uh, I, I don't go out and, and sue folks. Uh, what I try to do is I try to work with interdisciplinary teams. So I don't fit neatly in a box. I love science. I love law. I love interdisciplinary approaches. So if you have a way, because sometimes actually the, the chair, well, Madam Chair is being very lenient with us. If you have something to suggest, working with these academics, that would allow Dr. Reed to do research without fear of being in court when she should be teaching classes, that would be wonderful if you could suggest that. Well, I think that we need to have interdisciplinary teams. I think we need to have transparent information. And the bottom line is, is the data are the data. I mean, one of the problems that you have with more junior lawyers and less seasoned lawyers who don't understand technical information is they're petrified that a scientist is going to say something to hurt their case. We have a larger public interest here. The truth is the truth. The data are the data. And those working on behalf of the Department of Justice and others need to, to take that into account. And so we're up to me. I think greater transparency is, is uh, the watchword. Dr. Lear. Yeah, I would just comment. I think that the administration strategy has very much been to favor the, the, the legal adversarial process here. And I can, I can understand the motivation to, to do that, to try to recover as much damage money as possible. But I think uh, that the downside of that is that it, it slows down and impedes the science that really should be done. And I think sooner or later, uh, the federal government is going to have to make some investments in, in uh, doing further research without regard to whether they're going to be able to recover those damages. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And now I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. De La Rocca. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. Dr. Weisberg. I'd like to learn more about the uh, loop current. I hate to be particularly regional, but I'm from the, the Tampa Bay area, and I'm especially concerned about the oil spill, how it's going to affect us. Uh, does the loop current appear to be a natural barrier for the Tampa Bay area as it relates to us 
being directly impacted by the oil slicks, sheen, or tar ball? The, the loop current stays in deep water. And on the west coast of Florida, the continental shelf is, well, let's say, about 100 miles wide or wider. And so the west coast of Florida is actually buffered by the, by the extent of the continental shelf. If oil gets entrained into the loop current, and it has been, then it flows south. And presently, the loop current has shed what we call an eddy. So the oil is actually staying in that eddy as opposed to continuing into the Florida Straits and up the East Coast. Uh, under other situations, the oil could go up the East Coast of Florida, where the continental shelf is very narrow, at least off of Miami, and that oil can come in proximity to, to land. So um, the loop current is extremely important. Monitoring how it evolves between now and several months from now, as long as there's oil out there, is critical because that could be a game changer. It can determine the loop current could conceivably go all the way to the wellhead. And if it does that, then a lot of the oil that's up there is going to be transported out of that region. And unfortunately, we can't predict exactly how the loop current will behave. How will, uh, how will the weather uh, affect uh, maybe a hurricane, uh, God forbid? Uh, how will that affect, alter your trajectories uh, regarding the Tampa Bay area or for the Gulf Coast for that matter? It's difficult to say exactly what a hurricane will do because it depends from what direction that hurricane may, may approach. So, for example, if a hurricane came ashore somewhere in Georgia, the region of the oil spill would have very strong winds blowing from west to east. That could drive oil along the coast of Florida. If, on, on the other hand, a, a hurricane came into the Gulf of Mexico from the south and progress west, westward, those winds would be blowing from uh, east to west. So it's, it's really impossible to state what the impact of a hurricane would be without knowing um, uh, about the actual properties of that hurricane. But there certainly would be an impact. We just can't really predict in advance. Other members of the, the panel, would you like to respond to that question or any question that I ask? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make some observations about the, the wetland side of the equation. Um, in Louisiana and, and in, in, in Mississippi and, and Alabama thus far, we have been very lucky, I think, in, the, in that most of the oil is still out in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's not good that it's there, but it, it could be a lot worse uh, in the wetlands. And what you see when you see these images uh, on television is, is the oil is largely around the edge of the marsh, and the marsh kind of catches it as it comes in. And this is exactly what we saw in the Lake Beret spill uh, a number of years ago in Louisiana. I think one of the things that I worry about is not a big hurricane, but perhaps a small tropical storm that just lifts the water level a couple of feet. And so that instead of the grasses sticking out of the water at high tide, that when a storm comes in, the whole marsh is covered. Not a big enough storm that we evacuate New Orleans or something like that, but the kind of minor tropical storm that we get a lot in, in the Gulf of Mexico that could just actually spread this oil much further uh, into the wetland environment. We've been, we have oil in some of our wetlands already. We've been lucky. It's mostly around the edge. But, you know, we are getting into the season where we have events that just could carry it a lot further, and that could make it a much more widespread problem in the wetland environment than it is at the moment. Anyone else? Yes, please. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. I think uh, Florida has been very fortunate, by and large, that the currents have done what they've done and the oil has stayed offshore. And uh, I also I own property in St. Petersburg, and I'm a, a courtesy uh, professor at USF. And so I have a, a strong interest in what goes on there as well. Uh, I think that uh, the tourist, tourism industry has been uh, really dealt a hard blow by uh, media reports that suggest the situation is worse. And I, and I would encourage people to get the word out that, uh, that Florida is still open for business. And there are only certain areas of it that are under, under uh, siege right now from the oil. I you promise must uh, I'll do my best to get the word out. Can yes, please, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wish I did. <laughs> I have one more question, if I may, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weisberg, could you tell me a little bit more about the integrated ocean observing system? What is, uh, has it been useful in the past? Can it be useful in the future? Uh, 
the answer is yes, it has been useful in the past. It's, it's actually useful right now. It could be much more useful if we really begin to implement it. And so there was a concept advanced in 2002 for this integrated ocean observing system that would be a full partnership between the agencies and the academics and the private sector. And there was an original ramp up uh, to $500 million that had been suggested in 2002. The President's Commission on Ocean Policy increased that to $750 million. I've been using numbers more like a billion myself. Um, whether or not these dollars are adequate depends upon how they're distributed. And so when I say partnership, I mean a true partnership. The academics have an extremely important role to play, as does the private sector and the agencies, obviously. Um, but R&D, research and development, is really the purview of the academic community. Operations, obviously, is the purview of the agencies. But we can't improve upon our operations unless we have adequate R&D. And we can't improve upon our environmental stewardship unless we really understand how these systems work. So if you want to fix your car, you've got to open up a book and see how, how the thing works. Otherwise, you can't fix your car. We don't know well enough how our coastal oceans work. And so that's going to be what IUs can provide for us, that set of observations and models and enough people thinking about this massive problem that we can really start bringing closure to our understanding of the workings of the deep ocean to coastal ocean to estuary. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize what Bob said. I think he's absolutely right about uh, distinguishing the operational side from the need for, for, uh, for R&D. Uh, we really can't make progress until we do the necessary R&D, and that is going to be continuing as circumstances change. We live in an environment that has uh, constant new challenges, and accordingly, we need to always be up on our research. You never get to the stage where you know enough to, to deal with everything. And uh, I think that is one real lesson that's going to emerge from this event. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you for allowing me to sit on the panel, and I yield back. Thank, I thank the gentleman from Florida. I guess I'm going to ask the final question here uh, before we close the uh, subcommittee hearing. On behalf of my colleagues, I'm sure they are very uh, anxious to hear the answer to this question. Can anyone on the panel speak to the safety of seafood from the Gulf? Given what we do not know about the dose and the toxicity of the oil and the uh, dispersant, how will we know when our seafood is or is not safe to eat? We're all anxious to know. Can anybody answer that? We have, uh, we have certainly in Louisiana uh, very good programs in place even before this event came through about seafood safety. We have extensive monitoring of, of oyster beds. The, uh, the State Department of Health and Hospitals in conjunction with the State Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. We have, this is the kind of thing that is vital to us in Louisiana. <laughs> you know, we don't want a bad reputation about our seafood. That we, we regularly close oyster leases if there is a problem. Uh, with any kind of microorganism or anything like that. I think the approach in Louisiana is that seafood safety, good seafood, tasty seafood, healthy seafood that's not going to get you sick, that, that's our brand, if you like. And so the state has very good programs in place at the moment, and uh, I am confident uh, that they are only going to be allowing to market uh, seafood which is safe. Thank you. That's a very good answer. Now we can have our seafood lunch and dinners. I can also uh, comment on that. I'd like to just echo very strongly what uh, Denise just said. And I, as a former Sea Grant director, I, I know something about seafood and the attention that is paid to having uh, quality seafood. Uh, I was also in this area as a Maryland Sea Grant director back when the Kisteria crisis hit in the 90s. And I can tell you that uh, the, the worries about seafood in, in one very small geographic area caused uh, people to shun seafood in a much wider area even when there were no effects going on uh, from Kisteria. And I'm worried about the same thing going on here. It's almost like the tourism thing. If the oil doesn't reach the seafood, it's not going to be a contamination problem. And the oil has not reached a lot of the, uh, of the fisheries that we are, are now using to treat seafood. 
uh, obviously the state agencies in all the states will be monitoring this closely, as will FDA and uh, 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 NOAA and others who are involved with this, and I'm confident that they'll be very cautious. Well, thank you, and that's good news. I uh, want to thank the second panel and all of the witnesses for their participation in the hearing today and uh, like to remind the members of the subcommittee uh, that they may have additional questions for the witnesses and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. In addition, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days for anyone who would like to submit additional information for the record. So if there is no further business before the subcommittee, the chairwoman thanks the members for their participation here this morning. And the subcommittee now stands adjourned.